few minutes. We're waiting for some more chairs to be brought in. This is a call to order the April 6, 2022 regular meeting of the Duck Town Council. At this time, I'd like to ask a member of the Community Development Department, Jim Gould, if he'd lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Jim. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Before we go on to item number two, public comments, I'd like to make a few comments about that tonight. There'll be a three limit time limit on public comments to the council. Um, others, if they wish to speak, may give their name and address and yield their three minutes uh, to a other speaker. So, but they have to be, uh, you're going to get one time to speak for three minutes. And we have two people here tonight, Jan Collins and Doug Brindley, who are talking about resolutions that are going to be on the uh, a consent agenda tonight. So I would like those two speakers if they would go first during public comments. I'm so glad everybody's here because I thought I was just going to be talking to you. <laughs> I'm here on a community venture. Um, I am Jan Collins and Vice President of the Dementia Friendly Coalition. You may have seen our purple seahorse at some restaurants here in the area. These uh, decals represent that the restaurant or the business has been trained to become dementia friendly. What does that mean? That means that business took a 20 minute uh, program from our volunteers and what we do is explain how to redirect and how to approach people that have dementia so that loved ones feel comfortable in taking their family member out to a restaurant or a business and they know that they'll be respected and taken care of if a situation arises. The Dementia Friendly Coalition is the result of a community health needs assessment which revealed individuals with dementia and their at-home caregivers needed more support. Our initial group, the Healthy Carolinians, in partnership with the Outer Banks Dementia Task Force, was created in March of 2014. As an outgrowth of that partnership, the Outer Banks Hospital initiated the Dementia Friendly Volunteer Program, which led to the Outer Banks Hospital becoming the first dementia friendly hospital in all of North Carolina. The hospital is now training other hospitals to achieve this designation. We transitioned from the Dementia Task Force to the Outer Banks Dementia Friendly Coalition, a 501c3 charitable organization in June of 2020. Here on the Outer Banks, we have 19 dementia-friendly restaurants and over 10 dementia-trained businesses. Taylor Sugg was fantastic. He got me to go into all of his seven branches to train. And that, again, is a place where people will go and sometimes get confused in their banking and a way to recognize people that they need help. We have support groups for caregivers and one-on-one -on -one support 
entirely staffed by volunteers. We have Julie Hanner from the Kill Devil Hills Police Department, who heads Project Lifesaver, a 24-hour locator service using electronic transponders. And Gail Sanesso of Gem Day Service is a contributing member to our caregiving support services. Last fall, we held our first Love to Remember tennis tournament, raising over $40,000. The community realized the need to help our caregivers. With these funds and in partnership with Sheila Davies of the Dare County Health and Human Services, we started on March 21st a day out program for at-home caregivers. Every Monday from 9.30 to 1, caregivers can bring their loved ones to the Dare Rec Center and we will engage them in, meeting, in meaningful activities until they're picked up. Going forward, our goal is to educate the public at large about the growing need for the community to accept and support both the li those living with dementia and assist loved ones who are providing the care. Along with that, we want people to know that we're a place for caregivers to come. We provide educational conferences, like the one we held on March 30th. We had two speakers who showed caregivers how to support their loved ones through the long road of dementia. Dr. Okravi went into the different types of dementia and explained some of the new drugs that are coming to market. We will find out on April 11th whether Medicare will provide payment for these meds. The drugs right now have been shown to slow down the progression of dementia, but does not restore brain matter that's been lost. Alzheimer's dementia is not going away. It is becoming more prevalent, and today there is no cure. We need to educate the public and eliminate the st social stigma attached to the disease. So I have provided information to you all, and there's also back here for people. And I'm here just to say, if you know someone who's caring for someone that is in any need of any help, we do exist. And basically, if, and if you know somebody has a business or a restaurant and wants the training, you know, have them contact us, and there's information on that for them. And thank I you, thank Jan. You. We'll deal with your resolution during the consent thank agenda. You. Thank you so much. Good evening. How y'all doing tonight? Great. Uh, uh, Mayor and Commissioners, uh, my name is Doug Brindley. I'm the president of the Outer Banks Association of Realtors. The association now has over 1,200 members in residential and commercial sales, property management, as well as lenders, insurers, appraisers, inspectors, and other affiliate members. Can't throw a stick around here without hitting a realtor. With me today is uh, uh, Jimmy Anderson. He's our uh, chairman of our task force for diversity, equity, and inclusion. The board recently approved several initiatives set forth by the DEI task force on fair housing and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that's why I'm here today. We'd like to present you with a copy of the National Association of Realtors biannual magazine on common ground. I have a few copies here for y'all. I'll leave them here. Uh, uh, the late, this latest issue focuses on addressing the housing shortage and affordable housing issues, and we're all familiar with those problems that uh, occur here on the Outer Banks. I'd like to, uh, you to become aware that April 11 marks the 54th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Outer Banks Association of Realtors is committed to ensuring that all prospective home buyers, sellers, and tenants are treated fairly and equally without discrimination. To further bring attention to fair housing, we ask that you join us in a proclamation April as Fair Housing Month. And uh, I have a proclamation here for a, I'll read. Whereas the Fair Housing Act enacted on April 11, 1968, enshrined in the federal law the goal of eliminating racial segregation and ending housing discrimination in the United States. And whereas the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in housing based on race, color, religion, sex, familiar status, national origin, and disability, and commits recipients of federal funding to affirmatively further fair housing in their communities. And whereas the town of Duck is committed to the mission and intent of Congress to provide fair and equal housing opportunities for all. And whereas our social fabric, the economy, health, and environment are strengthened in diverse, inclusive communities. 
And whereas more than 50 years after the passage of the Fair Housing Act, discrimination still persists and many communities remain segregated. And whereas <clears throat> acts of housing discrimination and barriers to housing equality opportunity are repugnant to a common sense of decency and fairness, now for there it be resolved that the town of Duck does hereby declare the month of April 22 as Fair Housing Month. And the town of Duck as an inclusive community committed to fair housing and to promoting appropriate activities by private and public entities to provide and advocate for equal housing opportunities for all residents and prospective residents in Duck. Thank you for this opportunity to bring this to you. And oh, I went over my three. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will deal with the resolution during the consent agenda. You'll notice there is a timer up there. I let both speakers run over in the three minutes because basically there was special presentations that support two of the resolutions on our consent agenda this evening. But we're still open for public comments. Michael Rollin, 149 Plover Drive. I'd like to cede my time to Miriam Rollin. Also 149 Plover Drive. And Jennifer Beckwith no. from... Jennifer Beckwith, 147 Plover Drive. I cede my time to Miriam Rollin. So based upon the rules tonight, uh, she'll have three minutes, there's nine minutes at the podium. Great, thank you so much. Mayor and town council members, I am Miriam Rollin, as I said, 149 Plover Drive. My statement incorporates key parts of the petition we're delivering today to you regarding the private beach access on Plover Drive and Duck. The petition has signatures just within one and a half weeks of 94 owners of 52 Plover Drive properties, including almost all of the owners of Duck Blind Villa condo units, which own the land that our Plover Drive private beach access easement exists on. Bob Hovey, who is here tonight, feigns a role as champion of public beach access, but has financial interest in both enabling his business, DVO, and the renters of his Osprey Ridge property to have free beach access. For him, it's a matter of money. Hovey, fresh off his recent clear court defeat regarding Sand Dollar Shore's private beach access, has now focused on Plover Drive for beach access and duck. In addition to Hovey, several rental agencies and real estate companies operating in Duck have illegally asserted public beach access via, public, via Plover Drive. For example, an ad by Shore Realty offering homes for sale in Osprey Ridge talks about the public beach access located at the end of Plover Drive and Resort Realty, Brindley Beach, sorry, uh, and other rental listings for Osprey Ridge also claim to have ocean access via Plover Drive. Javi has provided, as alleged support for his erroneous claim of public beach access via Plover, a deed from Pearl Guard made in 1976. Plover is and has been a state road, as provided in the deed. However, no state, county, or town ownership or control of the private beach access on Plover Drive was ever accepted by any public entity. And then, in 1979, each current plot of real property for sea acres on Plover Drive was established with deeds that include a specific grant of private easement rights for the beach access that says, quote, said land being conveyed together with easement of right of way to the Atlantic Ocean as shown on said plat, which said easement will be held in common with other lot owners in sea acres and Amy acres, end quote. And I've shared with the council all of the relevant documents, including the plats and deeds, several deeds. Because we have deeded rights to the beach access, therefore, the Plover Drive property owners maintain that beach access and have done so for years. As recently as March 26th and 27th, Plover Drive owners replaced the railings and supports on the beach access structure. All costs and labor were borne solely by Plover Drive property owners with affirmation by Duck Blind Villas, which owns the land on which the private easement runs. 
we also recently replaced a sign indicating the private nature of the beach access at the entry to the beach access easement, again with affirmation by duck blind villas. Note that any signage or structures on the private property of Duck Blind Villas would have to require DBV assent, and any signage on the Plover Drive roadway would have to require NC DOT approval. As the Duck Town Council is well aware, there is clear language on the Town of Duck website regarding the lack of public beach access in the Town of Duck. Quote, the Town of Duck neither owns nor maintains any public beach access locations. Access to our beach is limited to Duck residents, Duck renters, and their guests through privately owned and maintained locations. The Town of Duck does not allow parking along state roads, and there is no public parking area uh, areas at beach accesses. And the North Carolina Appellate Court decision in Hovey v. Sand Dollar Shores from April 6, 2021, which was just affirmed in March 2022 by the Supreme Court of North Carolina, makes it abundantly clear, quote, at the beginning of the decision, the town of Duck is a seaside resort community that provides no public beach access. All oceanfront lots there are privately owned and have been since before Duck was incorporated in 2002. The land between the beach and public streets and highways belongs to private landowners, end quote. The opinion also concludes, we, quote, we acknowledge that our holding means that the town of Duck, as an incorporated municipality, lacks public beach access. The opinion continues, the town has not sought to establish a public beach access and generally maintains that all of the beach access locations within town limits of Duck are located on private property. This court must uphold these private property rights under the law. The court clearly explained the process for dedicating land to the public, which had not occurred in the case of the beach access at Sand Dollar Shores. Quote, the plat map fails to show an unambiguous intention to dedicate the easement to public use, end quote. And, quote, intention alone is not adequate to accomplish a dedication for public use. A public authority must also accept the offer. This process clearly was not, also not followed in the case of any alleged dedication of land related to the private Plover Drive beach access. With the North Carolina Court of Appeals and North Carolina Supreme Court having closed off Hovey's efforts to claim a public beach access at Sand Dollar Shores or anywhere else in Duck, Hovey has recently raised a new claim, a prescriptive easement for the Plover Drive beach access. Prescriptive easement has been found, for example, when a road over one property has been the only access to another property and has been used daily by the owners of the second property in order to access their property. However, in a beach access prescriptive easement case in North Carolina, the effort to establish prescriptive easement failed because, quote, mere use alone of a purported easement is not sufficient to establish the element of hostile use or use under a claim of right, end quote, one of the requirements for prescriptive easement, and, quote, the adverse or hostile use of a purported easement must be for a continuous and uninterrupted period of at least 20 years. As to Plover Drive private beach access, there has been no continuous uninterrupted use for at least 20 years by Hovey or other non-Plover owners or guests regarding the Plover Drive beach access. And while any claim of prescriptive easement would be uh, far-fetched from the start, Hovey had made stipulations in the Sand Dollar Shores case Look at number 13 and number 17 of Hovey's January 23rd, 2020 trial court stipulations, where he talked about repeated use of the Sand Dollar Shores beach access over a number of years, completely undermining any such assertion by him of prescriptive easement for the Plover Drive beach access. He can't have prescriptive easement to every single uh, beach access that he's ever used. Given all of this, it's abundantly clear there is no valid claim by Hovey or anyone else that Plover Drive or any duck beach access is a public beach access or a beach access with anyone else having rights in the case of Plover Drive other than Plover Drive owners and guests. 
Therefore, we, the undersigned Plover Drive owners, petition the Town of Duck to do three things. One, ensure and specify on the Town of Duck website and newsletters police enforcement of no parking restrictions on both sides throughout the length of State Road 1417 that's called Plover Drive. Two, reject any illegal attempts by any who are not property owners on Plover Drive and Duck to exercise any control of the private beach access easement. And three, communicate with rental agencies and real estate companies operating in Duck, directing them to cease and desist from false advertising regarding beach access via Plover Drive for rental properties and real properties not located on Plover Drive. I'm happy to answer any questions, and thank you very much for your time and attention to this issue. Thank you, Miriam. Hi, all. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kelly McDonald. I am uh, president of Duck Blind Villas Homeowners Association, 134 Plover, and um, I am here representing all um, 25 units owners. Um, also in support, as we did, um, submit the petition with Miriam and the documents that have already been presented to you, and just want to echo um, the sentiments made already, and that we um, vehemently oppose any public beach access on Plover, and uh, um, and continue to enforce our private parking, that all appropriate signage is there within Duck Blind Villas, within our parking lot, as well as within the street side cul-de-sac as well. So thank you for hearing us today. Thank you. My name is Philip L. Johnson. I took over possession of Duck Blinds 1D and Doug Brown's Villa. We have a limited liability company out of Virginia with eight siblings. My father is John Joseph James Johnson. My mother is Beverly Ann Obal Johnson, who just passed away on 3.30. I took possession of it on 3.25. This is a deed I got from the records office. And it truly says that, I'll leave this with you, I'm not gonna read it out, I'll let y'all do it. But pretty much it says that we own all the Duck Lines Villa in North Carolina, and we'll turn it over to the Atlantic Township, which includes Duck Township. And it was bought in 1989 out of Pennsylvania. And my father did the draft. This is a copy of the LLC, and we would like to transfer the LLC to North Carolina because it was done wrong in Virginia. And the LLC was set up in Virginia, which is unusual, but that was supposed to be incorporated in to North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Anyone else would like to address the council this evening? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Robert Hovey. I live at, uh, I own a home at 103 Osprey Ridge Road, and I own a business called Duck Village Outfitters, which is pretty much just across the street. Um, I wish I had more than three minutes. I have a lot to say, but um, I think I'll try to try to get in the most important things. First of all, I apologize. I had, had no idea there's going to be so much opposition to me using the beach that I've been using most of my life on Plover Drive. Um, in 1976, um, Plover Drive was very clearly and unambiguously deeded to the public, um, and it's been constantly being used by the public since then. When her claim um, that, I'm sorry that I have to disagree with you, that there was no continuous use for 20 years. Um, I started doing surf lessons in 1996. Um, before that, um, at the very beginning, you might not realize that Plover Drive was uh, actually drive over beach access. And when it was clearly and un unambiguously deeded to the public in the 70s, it was used for that purpose, people launching their dories and um, using the beach as a drive on access. Um, so any claim that it wasn't being used for 20 plus years is is um, not, not exactly true. Um, 
The other thing is the deed was very clearly and unambiguously deeded to the public. So what happened um, on Seabreeze Drive has nothing to do with Plover. Um, that, was, that was a total different set of circumstances. Um, there was restrictive covenants, things that the courts ruled on. Um, it's been being used. Um, there's, um, I'm not sure what, how the town would benefit from not having parking at the end of Plover. I think it would be really bad timing to start it at the beginning of the summer when it's been being used as public parking for 50 years down there. And as you guys know, this I've lost track of how many times I've approached the council about this issue. It's been going on for 20 years, pretty much. I've been coming up here, never getting a response, never getting a, a, even a thank you, or you know, just just always just getting blown off. And um, I would appreciate if you know some sort of discussion for the town. I think it, uh, based on what these people have brought up, I think it is worthy of getting put on the agenda at an upcoming meeting. Obviously, there's a lot of people concerned, and I think before you'd go and start putting up no parking signs and making strict rules that could easily get overruled by the court, I think that we should, we should have discussion of it. Um, we should have discussion about the parking issues before any 50 years of parking gets shut down entirely. Um, the sign issues, obviously, um, you know, there's, there's been signs. And then the last thing, I got 17 seconds to say this, is Duck, Duck Pier was a public beach until the terrorist attack in 2001, September 11, 2001. I would really request that the town consider going after Duck Pier. I mean, I could call the army or something, but if the town was to say, hey, what happened to this beach access? How come several beaches have been reopened across the country on federal land but not Duck? I think it would have a lot more impact than if I did it. And I think that you owe it to the citizens of Duck to be able to get that access back. But there's, We've been shut down. The terrorists kind of won that. There's no real reason why that beach access and parking and public drive on access, the gazebo picnic area. If you go on, on the um, hover on the GIS uh, or Google Maps or anything, you'll see that the parking lot's still there in good shape. There's still a gazebo. There's still opportunity for access. Well, I think the town should really pursue that as well. But I really think that um, putting Plover on an upcoming agenda before making any moves would be a would be the right move. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm Lori Ackerman, the town clerk, and I'm reading public comments from Ron Blunk on behalf of the HOA and property owner forum members. Recently, I sent you an email reporting the NC Supreme Court's refusal to review the Hovey versus Sand Dollar Shores beach access lawsuit. That left standing the NC Appeals Court decision that concluded the Sand Dollar Shores access is private and not public. Please read the email below written by Robert Hovey to the town of Duck. Note that he's seeking and that he is asking the town council to include his request in the April town council meeting agenda for discussion. Number one, he wants to now use the Plover access, Ocean Access Walkway for public use. Number two, he wants the town to publicly state whether the police will respond to any property owner complaints about his public use of the Plover Ocean Access Walkway and prevent him and the public from using that access walkway. Number three, he wants the town to negotiate with the Army Pier to return the public access that previously existed on the Army Pier property. While Hovey is referencing the Plover Access Walkway, I would guess he's really thinking about public access at any and all other community access walkways within the town. That might include your community access walkways. Here's my perspective on Hovey's request to the town. I agree that the town should publicly state the police will respond to any community complaint about public use of any community access walkway in Duck. <clears throat> This should apply to community sound access as well as community ocean access. The police will enforce private access only restrictions when responding to a complaint. The police will enforce no parking restrictions around community access walkways when responding to a complaint. I agree that the town should actively pursue public access to the beach with local Army peer management and with the Army officials above them if necessary. It should be noted that the town has had a long-standing goal of providing public beach access as stated in the last Town of Duck Cama land use plans. In my opinion, the Army Pier is the only viable alternative for this. Please respond to my email. Let me know if you agree with my perspectives or not. 
He has a second email that says, I received 39 responses from property owners to my email. Here's a brief summary. 39 owners agreed, uh, mostly agreed with his perspective. Zero owners disagreed or mostly disagreed with his perspectives. Two owners neither agreed or disagreed with his perspectives. Several owners had questions or perspectives of their own. A few owners were not sure the town should push the Army Pier management very hard for using their property for public access. A couple of owners were not familiar with private versus public streets in Duck and the impact that may have on the public access to the beach. Several owners expressed concern over potential retaliation from Robert Hovey if opinions were made public. Several owners had suggestions for the town on how to research, identify alternative ways to provide public access. Several owners felt Robert Hovey was making an issue over public access for his own business interests in town and not the general interest for the overall public. Lori, time is up on that. Thank you. Anybody else like to address the council this evening? My name is Greg Beckwith. I am a um, property owner at 147 Plover, and I've been a property owner at that uh, residence since 1996. And yes, we have seen um, Mr. Hovey uh, surf lessons uh, participate, um, whether it's from 1996 or not, I can't say. But the, but the reason that Mr. Hovey's argument fails with respect to a prescriptive easement, he's not asking for a prescriptive easement for himself to go over there and use that. He's asking for a prescriptive easement for anybody who's willing to take a surf lesson. Um, he's asking for a prescriptive easement for anybody who may engage in a weekly rental of his place. Prescriptive easements are such that they have to be continuous for 20 years, uninterrupted for 20 years. It doesn't inure to a rental person who rents his place for a, um, a week. It doesn't inure to the benefit of a surf class that he wishes to have there, and that's why um, it fails. It also fails for another reason, is that we have had signs posted, and sometimes they get taken down by someone, unbeknownst to us, but we have signs posted, and those signs have been posted from as early as 2002 by the residents of Plover, uh, indicating that the, that the access was uh, strictly for the use of uh, C acres, um, Amy acres. Um, and so, by placing that sign, that put him on notice that he was trespassing. That puts him on notice. So if you go 19 years, 364 days, and I kick you off that easement for one day, uh, because I think you're trespassing, it just starts the whole 20 years running again. That sign that was placed there in 2002 put him on notice that he was trespassing. That stopped the running of the 20 year period at that juncture. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Would I also like to address the council this evening? There being no one, we're going to close public comments. We're going to go on to item number three, the consent agenda. This evening, the agenda, consent agenda includes the minutes from the February 16th, 17th, 2022 annual retreat, minutes from the March 2nd, 2022 regular meeting, certain uh, easement extensions, Resolution 2204, a resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Duck, North Carolina, declaring the month of April as Child Abuse Prevention Month. Resolution, resolution 22-05, a resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Duck, North Carolina, declaring the month of April as Fair Housing Month and certain budget amendments. With that, I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Any discussion on the motion on the floor? There being none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes by this row. Going on to item number four, public hearing. A public hearing discussion consideration of ordinance 22-03, amending the penalty for a violation from a misdemeanor criminal offense to a civil penalty in the town's flood damage preventive 
uh, prevention ordinance. And with that, I'd like to turn over to our town attorney, Robert Hobbs. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, we're gonna open the public hearing for the proposed ordinance uh, 22-03. And at this time, I'll ask Drew Havens to make a presentation on behalf of the town staff. Thank you, Mr. Hobbs. Good evening, uh, Mayor Kingston, members of the council. I don't do this as well as Joe heard. Um, yeah. And I'll just take a point of personal privilege and just ask for a moment of silence as we remember Joe as he continues to recover um, from his health issues. Thank you all. <laughs> The subject of this public hearing is a text amendment regarding civil penalties for violations of the town's flood damage prevention ordinance. This public hearing was uh, properly advertised in the Coastal Times on March 20th and 27th and April 3rd and had been continuously posted in the town hall since March 16th. A little bit of background on this. Uh, at the advice of our town attorney in 2019, the town council modified uh, dozens of sections of the town code to clarify that most types of violations uh, were to be enforced by civil rather than criminal penalties. Subsequent to that action, the town adopted a new flood damage prevention ordinance following the state's model ordinance. That model ordinance con continued to contain uh, criminal penalties for violations. Recently adopted Session Law 21-138 took additional steps to decriminalize additional um, sections of local ordinances. So in order to comply with this new law, the staff and the, and the planning board are proposing to amend two penalty sections um, in the flood damage prevention ordinance. And as part of the recommendation, the, the planning board did find that these uh, two text amendments are consistent with the intent of the comprehensive uh, land use plan. And at their public meeting on February 9th, the planning board voted unanimously to approve these changes. And the changes are shown um, in the ordinance 22-03, and they are to section 150.27, which is the duties and responsibilities of the floodplain administrator. And you'll see um, the new text is underlined in the, uh, in the document that you have in the resolution. The old text is struck through. So all this is doing is just changing from criminal penalty to civil penalties in section 150.27. Similar in 150.28 corrected procedures, again, struck through the old language that uh, refers to criminal penalties and inserted new uh, civil penalty language. Those are the only two changes being contemplated by this ordinance and staff and the planning board respectfully ask for your consideration of approval. Any you questions? Have any, any questions? No questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there a presentation from the planning board? No. Okay. Thank you. At this time, if there are any members of the public who would like to address this uh, proposal, if you'd like to come forward, state your name and address and make your presentation. Okay. Seeing none, then any remaining questions from council on this proposal? None. All right. Thank you. Uh, then at this time we'll close the public hearing and you may now deliberate on this proposal. Just keep in mind this is an ordinance and or proposed ordinance and therefore it will require uh, at least four votes in favor to approve the ordinance on the first reading. If there are less than few, uh, four votes and it's still approved, then it would come back to a second reading. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Any further discussion by council? I'd just like to say that the planning board spent a great deal of time on this uh, at their March meeting, our, was it a January meeting, February meeting, uh, and they went over this thing quite thoroughly. Well, also, I, I'd like to add that just based on the information we received, that it, it came with a recommendation of our attorneys as well um, to change the ordinance uh, 
and making it a civil versus a criminal penalty in these cases. So uh, I think given, given all that, it, it definitely seems like uh, exactly what we should be doing. I make a motion that we approve ordinance 22-03, an ordinance to remove criminal sanctions and penalties from provisions of the flood damage prevention ordinance in the town code for the town of Duck, North Carolina. Any discussion on the motion on the floor? There being none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes five to zero. Moving on to item number five, old business items deferred from previous meetings. Discussion consideration of establishing a town property advisory committee. Uh, we first started discussing this, I believe, in December of last year. Uh, we've had some limited discussions on it. Um, we wanted to wait until we had a full council to have this discussion. Uh, it's envisioned that this advisory group would be, as we say, an advisory group to basically town staff um, on projects that are anticipated or planned to by the town. Uh, town manager, would you like to add anything to that discussion before we bring it back to council? projects or potential projects related to the town campus and to the Duck Trail. It's primarily just for oh, sorry, uh, guys. town facilities. Um, would, it was, has never really been envisioned as a committee that would just meet on its own and kind of drive its own agenda. This was something that we were looking to, to have, uh, again, just additional public perspective. But that's, yeah, that's about it. No, no, nothing's really changed from the staff perspective uh, since this was, this was first introduced. And there was, I, I understand there was some confusion uh, with the initial presentation and it, it was uh, tightened up and, and redefined in the, in the second iteration. So uh, it's up to, it's up to y'all what you want to do. You know, we, we'd love to have it uh, available and if not, we can certainly do without it as well. Thank you, Drew. I'll bring it back to the council for discussion. Um, I will start by saying basically my initial concern was the focus of the group, and it's kind of changed over the last couple of months, but the original focus being, um, as I saw it, as being more blue sky and coming up with ideas. But a lot of things have changed, too, because when we first had uh, the property advisory group, we did not have the staff that we have now, so it took more people to plan the path forward for the uh, for the town. Since then, we've grown, obviously, um, in experience and in staff. Uh, and, and, and I think that, in fact, this should be more single-focused. Um, I, would, I would assume, yes, you're going to give that advisory committee a task to look at. But I would like to see us organize that committee or that advisory group on an as-need basis based upon the requirement at hand. And I think the back to things like uh, the pedestrian planning committee, basically, you know, that was a particular task and a lot of public were involved. Uh, I would rather see us take that approach than in fact appointing a standing group uh, that may not be the right uh, composition for the task at hand, because it could change as we move through time. So uh, I still um, question the need for such a group at this point in time. And kind of that's my position, and with that, I'll open it up to the rest of council. Um, go ahead. Do you want to no, speak, I'm just Sandy? Say. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'll speak on this. Um, I did, uh, you know, reread the the latest uh, uh, memo from staff regarding uh, setting this up, uh, 
and uh, I also reread our minutes, you know, obviously that we, that we have discussed it, um, kind of waiting for full council participation to get everyone's view. Uh, my view is that um, having the public advisory committee uh, on available to ask questions of facilities, um, expansion of playground facilities, um, perhaps getting involved in uh, just ideas um, regarding amenities in the park and on the sidewalk itself or the, the, the multi-use path. Just, you know, it's just a way to engage uh, others in um, in the decisions. We don't have, say, for example, a Parks and Rec Committee, you know, our, our areas are limited, what we have as public property, but, um, but you know, I, engaging the town uh, to, to get some, you know, to, so that we're not relying on staff, for example, to, you know, de decide which style of bench might make sense or something. Th those are the things that are in my mind. Uh, I also say that anything that the advisory committee might come up with is going to have to go through a vote from the council and be approved. So it's more just input than anything else, um, not wanting to waste people's time, certainly, but, you know, just getting a variety of input. Uh, not to speak for uh, Councilman Whitman, but you know, looking at his concerns in the minutes were the uh, makeup of the committee and what it would be, um, you know, two from business, two from residential, uh, and, and the like. Um, so I, I don't know how, um, and there is really no uh, mention of how long the committee uh, is in play, except that you know, I guess it can be um, revised. Um, annually or, or looked at annually, but we did really well way back when we were young to have a property master plan advisory committee and, and, I, and I just feel that uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, in soliciting the opinions of, of, a, of those that, in the community that might like to be involved. So I would have no problem with this, uh, although you know, if the makeup is of a concern, I'd, I'd like to hear more discussion on that. Well, I, I think what I would say is that obviously uh, we're, we're open to input from the community and from the citizens always, and we want to be. And I think, you know, we, we, we've shown that uh, with our public uh, opportunity, you know, public uh, comment section. Uh, we did a survey concerning, you know, the uh, rezoning change and people responded to that. That was very good and very helpful. So obviously getting input from the community is critical, important, and we need to find more ways to do that. Um, on this committee, I would say a couple of things. Number one, I think if we had a standing committee, it would, it would, um, it would get sour after a while because it wouldn't be used enough, I don't think. Um, and people would lose interest. Um, they'd say, what am I doing? Why am I on this committee? Nothing's happening and so on. I, I think it might be better to um, use the ad hoc approach and say if, if there is a project or there is something you know, that we need public opinion on and we, or we want some input and expertise, kind of a sounding board, then I think we should create the committee to do that under the direction of the appropriate staff member let them meet with a specific target or task in mind, um, give their input, and then staff put it together and put it before the council. And then that committee could be disbanded, and then when another topic comes up, we could put together another group of people that were appropriate to that particular topic. And I think that could be a way to get, you know, to get um, input in. But to have a standing committee, I, I, I'm not sure that would, that would work. People would be waiting around for something to happen, and it might not happen again for months or, or whatever. But, you know, if, if we could find a way to draw upon community members as needed, that would be great. I think that, uh, I think this is a good idea to have this advisory committee. I think that any kind of input that we can get from the community is important. And obviously, um, people will participate. As far as people getting bored in between, um, I don't really see that as, a, as, a, as, as an obstruction to them doing what they're asked to do whenever they're asked to do it. If people are going to volunteer to do this job, um, they, they will be happy regardless of the length of time that expires between different projects that may, may be in search of advice from, from the community. And so I think that it's a good idea. As, and the makeup of the, of the committee that's been proposed, um, I think will give us enough of a diverse um, group so that we'll be able to have good decisions and good advice from these people. 
um, as far as how long the committee may stand or, you know, what, what their terms may be, that certainly can be addressed later on. But my opinion is I think it's a good idea. Monica, the answer to your question, this committee appointment would expire December 31st, 2023. <coughs> Excuse me. And I feel, you know, that we send out these surveys, we're going to allow everybody to respond to us that would want to respond and give us their opinion. And the town staff could put together a correlated list of what they're asking for. Just say new park benches, here's what we propose, what do you think? And I'm just using that as an example. <clears throat> We'd have the whole community give their input on it. And I'm looking at the uh, committee, you know, we've got <clears throat> two from the business community, two from neighborhood associations, and two at large. If you're gonna stick, use that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we should have split the town in half half from the north and half from the south. So we have a full complete, so we have both sides of the community. Just some additional comments, and I, and I think uh, certainly Tony hit on that, and that is public input, and I think all of us want public input, and I think there's many ways to get public input, and it all depends upon, I think, the subject at hand. And I kind of agree with having you know, what Tony's saying, having a standing committee and, you know, just available, I think that, it, once again, it's situational. And we can always use the example of uh, new equipment in the park for, you know, the playground. Well, you really need probably young input for that. So that's, you know, would that standing committee be the right type of people, the composure of that to, in fact, advise on what we need in a playground? Or would it be younger families in town that would, or would it be, you know, um, done through a survey. And especially today with the technology, we get good responses to our surveys and we lot of, get a lot of good input and a lot of opinions, a lot of suggestions. And, you know, I'd rather have more than less inputting on, on things that in fact we're looking at. And we know that in fact when we put a survey out there, we get a great response and a quick response. So once again, I, I don't see the need for putting this advisory committee in place. I think the ones we had in the past were because we were short of staff, and I think we have a very competent staff, and as Tony says, if in fact I think we need input, we can go out and get the input in one way or another. And so that's, I'm just qualifying my opinion on that. Uh, just going toward the idea of creating ad hoc committees on an as-needed basis, um, I certainly understand uh, your objections or your arguments against the idea um, in terms of um, different expert levels of expertise. I think you could say that about, you know, any of us here uh, making a decision in terms of what's the best park equipment, you know. Um, when was the last time I was on a swing? Oh, not too long ago. No, kidding. But anyway, uh, the uh, we do we are, you know, limited each of us individually in, in what we know. What what I do th uh, and, and what, so in that regard, if we had uh, kind of creating ad hoc committees on the fly for each particular issue, um, that would be a little bit of burden on staff to rally up some troops. You know, send out a survey. Who would like to be on this committee? I guess maybe you know, what would the criteria be? Um, staff would then have to decide. Uh, so that would be one more thing that they would have to do to solicit the input from the, from the community. Uh, surveys are a great way uh, to get input on particular issues. My only thought is where we're talking about a, the park area, the public areas, the walkways, and, and the areas that we have some jurisdiction over, the public uh, areas, that um, there is some sort of continuity that you look for. And so if you're just getting one opinion, you know, one survey, isolated, sort of, you know, um, siloed, if you will, without a larger vision that, a, um, you know, that could kind of look at it holistically, that you might be losing something there. Um, again, everything with all the decisions will ultimately be made by council. Um, uh, to vote on or approve uh, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I understand that, you know, I think there's work to be done regardless. Either it's like town staff has to 
develop a committee for each particular issue, that seems to me like a lot of work. Um, doing a survey, you might get isolated viewpoints and not see the big picture on, on a particular um, point uh, or picture, particular thing you're trying to develop. And in this case, I think we're just trying to look for, you know, the public areas. It's, it's the park. Um, so, um, uh, I would think that a committee that was made up of, you know, a, a variety, I, I don't really particularly like the idea of north versus south, it seems somehow, you know, but I, I understand what you're saying. You want it to be diverse and you want it to be representative of the whole town. Um, but you would think that anybody on that committee might reach out to their neighbors and to their, the youth in their area and say, hey, we're making this decision, what do you think? Or, you know, hey, let's send out a survey and these are the choices that, you know, we're coming up with. And so it, it is a way to alleviate work on staff. I think that's where it initiated. And yes, we do have a large staff, but I see them pretty darn busy uh, with a lot of things. So I just was trying, I think it was a way to get more, a, a, an organized way to get more public input, but without trying to just like put it all on staff to come up with ideas. And um, so I don't really have an issue with it uh, based on everything I've said. I think that there's, there's one other benefit um, to this that's sort of an ancillary benefit that um, maybe we, didn't, we haven't thought about. There's gonna come a day when none of the five of us are gonna be sitting here. And this is an opportunity to reach out into the community and get people more involved. And so they decide when they see how this whole works, whether or not they want to maybe someday get involved in this and end up in one of these seats. And so I, I think it's an opportunity for, to, for education on both sides of the coin, with the public and with ourselves. Yeah, I'm not opposed to a committee at all. I mean, I think it's a good way to see, to have people give input on, it's a good way for just what Rob said, for people to get closer to the workings of the town and the council and so on. I just don't think that the same, if it's eight people or six people, are the right people every time a, an issue comes up. I think, um, you know, we, we would then be, we would then be guilty of not getting enough input or the right input on a project. I just think if something comes up and it needs input, it's, it's really, and that committee, in my opinion, would just be a starting point. It would be, hey, we've got this uh, situation here, I don't know, say whatever it is. We want to take down the amphitheater and build uh, two amphitheaters or something. You know, what do you think of that idea? You know, um, and bounce it off the committee, get the pros and cons, while they feel about it, what they think, and then, you know, form some opinion, thank them for their input, and then go out to the larger community and say, Here's what we're thinking of doing. What do you think of this idea? You know, some of your fellow citizens have vetted it. They think it's a good idea. How do you feel about it? But there's no rule that says those same people would be the ones that have the right skill set for another project that came along. So all I'm saying is I'm in favor of the committee. I don't know that a standing committee is the best thing to do. Uh, I, but I think committee, <coughs> committees pulled together and used as needed on projects would give us the same thing, and it would expose more people to the process as opposed to the same, the same group. Um, what did the guy say at our conference the other day? You know, it's always the STP, the same 10 people. We want to make sure that we don't have the same 10 people, that we're getting the same 50 people. Uh, so I think, you know, changing it, changing it up on that would be, would be good, just my opinion. I don't, think, I don't think anyone's disagreeing that we need input and we need a committee. It's just the structure and the mm -hmm. function of it. And Sandy, thank you for reminding me that the committee is terminates on, you know, in a year and a half at the end of 2023. I know how long it takes to kind of come up with decisions and, and things like that. It seems like that would be not that many issues that could be tackled at the, till by the end of 2023. Um, so maybe then we don't, you know, we don't allow people to re-up or we look for, you know, six more people or something like that. But I think we are just getting a little bit um, bogged down in the, in the, in the details and, um, you know, of it. Um, I think we should, you know, I think I, I'm in favor of, of proceeding. I'm kind of hard pressed to identify something now where we need the advisory committee. But I think back about trash and doing the survey and how valuable that was to get input from the total public of Duck. And I think that's much more valuable because I'd have the same concern Tony has, and that is, you know, maybe you have the same 10 people or maybe you don't have the right people. And I would like to do it on a demand basis and, and get, yes, get people involved, and we've done that before. Um, 
but I think without specific tasks in front, I, I, I don't think it's a value right now. I think we get public input other ways and <coughs> as needed by staff, identify it and set up an advisory group for that particular project. So. And I do think that just uh, that having a committee like this would not exclude us from doing surveys. I think surveys oh, are no. great. No, no, they, we're not they, saying that. And so, yeah, I would look for all of it, as much as we can get, depending on the issue. And even if we had an ad hoc or a standing committee making a decision, you could certainly still survey the community and say, this is what we're thinking. Do you like A, B, or C? And see what kind of results you get. So there's a lot of opportunity and I do hear us all agreeing at least on the fact that we like public input. Well, I think to move this along, I'm gonna make a motion that we suspend establishing a town property advisory committee, but leave it open for establishing <coughs> committees as needed by town staff for specific projects. I'll put that motion on the floor. Any discussion on the motion on the floor? Just so I understand, Mayor, you're talking about um, suspending the idea of having a standing committee, but if the town comes to us, staff comes to us and says they'd like a committee to be set up for, say, park improvements, that the staff would then create the committee, or we would? Well, they'd come with a recommendation. Of creating a committee sure. and what it would be made of, like they just did on this one? Sure. Yes. The, 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 I the mean, very similar to, in fact, the pedestrian committee that we had that laid out the, uh, the whole plan for pedestrian safety and the, bicycle safety. Would the, you feel better if it was just said park advisory committee or something along those lines? I don't, I, I don't see it necessary. Uh, the, the only issue I'm gonna talk about with the, as far as ad hoc or, or having staff reach out to people is this, is this just adds another layer of bureaucracy that's gonna, de that's gonna delay whatever needs to be getting done as opposed to having people that you know you can speak to readily at hand and can make a decision without having to gnash their teeth about it for three weeks while we're trying to figure out who's going to be the people that are going to be involved in this. This is, a, this is an opportunity to put a big wrench in the toolbox. We usually have a lot of lead time on projects, number one, and the town staff would probably know the type of people they want. And, and I mean, I just think that, you know, the other thing is if you have an advisory committee, you've got to bring them up to speed too. They're not going to be experts on everything. So based upon what the project is going to be, you have to bring them up to speed before, in fact, you can ask for opinions I, or, I don't or think that results. The, the, I don't think that the, the staff is proposing um, experts. This is, this is an opportunity to get public feedback that is in, a, in addition to perhaps um, the survey stuff that we do. I think this is just people that are readily available to ask questions who will then, they'll go and ask their neighbors, who will go and ask their neighbors. And so immediately we're going to get a much bigger cross-section of opinion than we would normally get. I, th I think you've got a very limited, you get a limited audience there when you would just ask certain people for opinions. And I think if it's that important to the town, we're gonna want a, a much wider response. So, we have a motion on the floor. Any other further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? Nay. Nay. The motion passes three to two. Going on to item number six, new business. Discussion consideration of resolution 22-06. A resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Duck, North Carolina, supporting construction of the mid Currituck Bridge and its continued inclusion in the State Transportation Improvement Plan. Drew, are you going to handle that? Yeah. Me too. I just have to, Mr. Mayor. So you have a, a draft resolution. Um, some of the other towns on the beach have adopted similar resolutions in the county office as well. This is just renewing our support for the town efforts to build the mid Currituck Bridge. Any further discussion by council? I just have a question. So uh, obviously I'm in favor of this, of this um, resolution here. M my question is, and the other towns, some other towns have done that as well. What do we do with that? Do we send it somewhere or something and say, you know, is it, yes. I mean, is it more than us just saying, yeah, we like the bridge? Like the bridge. Now, so we will, we will send this on to the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Okay. Um, and I think we will share it also with our um, legislative delegation throughout. Okay, cool. 
Yeah, and this is kind of reaffirming our position that we didn't support the bridge. Right. Um, I know that the county and Southern Shores are both doing similar resolutions, and I think you'll see them from the other towns. Um, everyone agreed basically to do that. We're also in discussions with Southern Shores about perhaps uh, preparing an amicus brief that they uh, go to the next trial, but that's with our lawyers right now. Yeah, this is just adding on and reaffirming something that we've a long held position that the town has had and uh, kind of freshens it up, I suppose, um, and reaffirms things since they've, um, you know, been in the works for so long. It came out of our meeting with the DOT at the retreat. I make a, a, a motion that we approve the resolution 22-06 a resolution of the town council of the town of Duck, North Carolina, supporting construction of the mid Currituck Bridge and its continued inclusion in the state transportation improvement plan. Any discussion on the motion on the floor? There being none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion passes 5 to 0. Going on to item number B, discussion consideration of resolution 22-07, a resolution of the town council of the town of Duck, North Carolina, supporting a Wright Brothers Tribute Museum and Observatory. Drew, would you like to make a few comments? So this uh, sample resolution was sent to us by the town of Kitty Hawk, who has adopted a similar resolution. Um, there's a private concern that's um, interested in building a Wright Brothers uh, Museum. Um, co-located with the visitor center um, just off the bypass in, in Kitty Hawk. And they're just looking for uh, support. These, these resolutions will be again sent to the North Carolina Department of Transportation who owns that. Showing uh, that there is local government support for this. Um, just to add on to that, there's been some uh, write-up in the papers about this. And apparently the people that in fact want to do it, I guess, have a, a worldwide collection of uh, memorabilia from the Wright brothers. And uh, they want it to be in Kitty Hawk and they want it to be on the Outer Banks. And uh, the initial design, it looks very impressive. So any, any discussion before we go to a motion? Um, just that it's a, a good resolution to read if you have a chance. It does discuss the, what the proposal will look like and um, the fact that it is fully funded through private investors. Um, not exactly sure if they're going to charge admission. I couldn't quite get that, that out of the uh, resolution, but it certainly is impressive with a lot of um, simulations and things for children and uh, quite, quite interactive. So it's an interesting, interesting project for sure. With that, I'll entertain a motion. Um, I make a motion. Monica's going to have to help me do this, right? Just um, the top. Uh, the, I, I support motion 2207, a resolution of the town council of the town of Duck, North Carolina, supporting a Wright Brothers tribute museum and observatory. That's perfect, Tony. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion on the motion on the floor? There being none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes 5 to 0. Well, it used to be we just said so move. You didn't have to do the whole thing. I don't let you get away with that. You want me to skip it, so that we're going to give you more table there. There you go. Well, thank you. Yeah. I keep falling in the slide. I know. We just keep pushing it. <laughs> okay. Item number C, discussion direction of the purchase of a replacement fire engine in accordance with full year 2023-27 capital improvement plan. With that, I'll turn it over to our town manager. Thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So um, we discussed with you your capital improvement plan, the draft capital improvement plan at your retreat. Um, one of the items in that uh, draft capital improvement plan is to click a mouse, um, is the replacement of engine 11, which is a 2005 uh, Pierce pumper. Um, so the CIP contemplates replacing that in fiscal 23. And you're wondering why I'm standing in front of you in fiscal 22. Um, the reason is we have an opportunity to save a significant amount of money um, by making the purchase or the order for purchase uh, prior to April 30. So I'm gonna go through that um, with you. And then there's likely to be 
some questions related to the primary question, which is, do you want to buy a fire truck? Um, the second question is, if, if the answer to that is yes, when do you want to do it? And then the third question will be, what do you want to do with the current piece of equipment that we have? When we get to the questions of why do we want to buy a fire truck or do you, you're going to ask questions about the condition and, and so on, reliability of the current piece of equipment. And I will say, I don't know, and I'm going to very ungracefully turn that over to Deputy Chief Bachelet, who will be able to answer those questions for you. Our CIP predicted a cost of $750,000 for a fire truck. Um, and if you think that's expensive, wait till we start talking about a ladder truck in subsequent years. Um, fire apparatus has gotten extremely expensive. Um, you know, Deputy Chief's been in the fire service for a number of years and he's seen a lot of cost escalation. I've been out of the fire service. When did I get out of the fire service? 2007 and the price is we could have bought two fire trucks for this price when I got out of the fire service. Um, someone talked to you a little bit. So if we order the, uh, this fire truck uh, before April 30, the price now is, is $760,000, so $763.54. So the CIP prediction, predicted price was just a little bit low. However, if we prepay, so we write them a check when we make, place the order, um, we can realize the savings of a little over 3.5%, $28,000 to bring the cost prepaid down to $735,000. If we wait until, so the answer is yes, we want to order a truck, but we don't want to do it right now, and we wait until after April 30th, the quote price is still the same. However, there's going to be a cost es escalation of a little over $53,000. Um, things are getting more expensive. Fire truck manufacturers are increasing their prices. So this is the new price. The new total then would be um, 813.5. So a, a big, a pretty big change, a little over 50, again, a little over $50,000. Um, saving about 3.68% again for prepayment. You can bring that down to $783,000. So why prepayment? Um, if we look at the scenario that we order it after April 30th and we don't prepay, so we're looking at an, a total cost of 813,000. If you run that for 10 years, which is how we've been paying for fire trucks, been paying for them over 10 years, 10 years, three and a half percent, interest alone is about $165,000. So by prepaying, we're saving the taxpayers $165,000. Yes, we do have the cash available um, to make this purchase. And in fact, that's why one of the reasons that you have the policies that you do and you've done the work you've done to build the fund balance to where it is now is so we can take advantage of opportunity like this um, and, and save a significant amount of money for um, the taxpayer. And then I'll just very briefly talk about the the trade-in or what to do with the old truck. Um, so the, the manufacturer is Pierce um, Fire Apparatus um, has offered a trade-in uh, price of $25,000 if we take, that, take advantage of that upfront. So when we place the order, they'll take $25,000 off the price. Um, we believe that, um, and the deputy chief can throw something at me if I say something wrong here, but we, we believe that we can get um, more than $25,000 for it when the new fire truck or fire, fire engine arrives, um, which by the way will be somewhere between 20 and 24 months. So call it two years from the time we place the order. That's how long, it, the, the, how, how big their backlog is in making fire trucks right now. So that's the setup. The question is, do you want to buy a fire truck? Um, as as you know, we, we began talking about this last year um, in the capital improvement plan, matter of fact, last year, you'll recall that we said, let's put the replacement of the ladder truck on hold because it was more important that the engine be replaced first because of some of the issues that we've been having with it. So do you want to buy a fire engine? Um, the deputy chief can answer any questions you might have about the condition um, of the current the current truck. Um, I can talk about numbers, but beyond that, it's going to be up to the deputy chief. So we've been having mechanical issues or pump issues with 11. 
and now 111 is also, what, eight years old? Are we having any issues with 111 or? So as far as 111 goes, no, we haven't had any major issues. Um, we expect maintenance issues. Um, we're still working on the maintenance issues. Um, we have things that we expect to run into the walls in the room due to wear and down in the wall wear and tear. Uh, Engine 11 with its age currently is presenting us with recurrent problems. Uh, one of the major problems that we've had with it is it's a first generation multiplex, which is how we wire the, the apparatus and the modules that they use at that point in time are out. Uh, and we're going <laughs> The, uh, oh, much better. <laughs> really not working. Um, the modules that they used at that point in time are no longer available. So when one goes down, while we keep one in stock, if we were to have two fail, the truck becomes out of service until we can get one rebuilt. Um, with supply chain issues that we're having, that begins to lead to long out of service times, and it's imperative that we have a working fire engine. So should a normal wear and tear, something as simple as a, a blown tire on engine 111 occur, and that engine happens to be down when we're waiting on a part that's not readily available, it becomes a major it, you know, crisis issue for us, if you will, um, of we've got to find a fire truck to put firefighters on the road in. Um, Currently, that truck is costing us a fair amount of money in maintenance annually, um, this year more so than others. Uh, you will all see it probably tomorrow leaving on a, a rollback to go to Virginia as it had some transmission issues. So we're having to send that out to get that fixed as well. Uh, so we're, we're seeing larger and larger recurring issues begin to occur with the, with the vehicle at this time. Do we know what those annual maintenance numbers are off the top of your head? I don't have them off the top of my head, but I can estimate based off of what I've been given on the transmission in issue alone that that could be anywhere from eight to 20,000. So I think the first thing we need to discuss is whether or not we want to buy a new engine. And then we'll talk about if in fact that's a yes, then we talk about whether to purchase it now or what. Yes, sir. So I think, go back to the council, I guess, is there a consensus, is there discussion on whether or not we want to purchase a new engine, which is two years out, correct? Probably. That's correct. That's a, a good ballpark estimate. It's two years from the time we sign a contract. So. We had a presentation at the retreat uh, that um, Chief uh, Black discussed the size of the, as I recall, and um, the uh, the fact that it was the newer versions were slightly smaller and a little bit more agile on the streets. But and then the company going with this Pierce, I believe it's called, is because so we can keep all of our fleet with the same repair that's fairly readily available if we do need repair. Is that correct? Yeah, and we have, fortunately, we have a very good working relationship with our maintenance contractor in that. Um, and that's where the benefit of having a Pierce fleet for us comes from, is that we can typically very quickly get things that we need when we need them. Um, unfortunately, some of the things we need are beginning to not be made anymore. So. Just because of the age of the vehicle? Yes, ma'am. And there are a lot of other departments on the beach, correct, Chief, that use pretty much exclusively Pierce apparatus as well. Yeah, there are there's several other departments that that primarily use Pierce in their, their fleets as well. I guess my question would be, <coughs> do we want to buy a fire engine? Do we want to have our firemen safe? And if they have to go to your house, do you want to put out a fire or have their pump work, start working then stop with two firemen inside, inside the house? And I don't want to see it happen here. Well, and I have to go by the recommendation of the professionals that um, it's not just about getting a shiny new piece of equipment. It, it is for public safety. Uh, I And I, I think the... the the presentation we've gotten today or at this meeting, ahead of the meeting uh, with these numbers, it, it, it makes it makes good sense to, to kind of strike now and order it with cash and get a great discount and save the taxpayers some money. That's, I, I'm in favor of it. Well, let's start by asking questions. Anybody object to the purchase of a new Engine 11? 
Um, let me just, I want to ask a couple of questions first. So uh, is Pierce, ex are they experiencing any of the same problems that, if you know, that the automotive industry is struggling with right now, things like chips to, to keep their, their engines running? So to my knowledge, they are not, that's not been presented to us. Um, their, their delays in delivery at this point are simply in sheer volume of, uh, they have, I believe a salesman said that they have 200 vehicles, uh, 200 pieces of apparatus that are in line to be built. Um, as an example, he gave a department inland in the state that had purchased an engine in January, in December, I believe, uh, and then went ahead and purchased their second in January, and there are six to eight months difference in the build time, just, and it was three weeks apart in their order time. Um, but as far as the the computer chip issue, I do not believe that they're having the same issue that the automotive industry is facing. So, and ultimately, this is we're we're going to give Pierce three quarters of a million dollars or a little bit more, and they're going to have that for two years before we get a truck. Correct. I mean, I agree with what Sandy said. Um, I don't want to see anybody imperiled for any reason in that in that job. It's got, we got to make sure that you all are safe. Um, my question is, has more to do, I think, with the, with the ladder truck and then this. It seems like if we're going we're gonna to get a new engine and then sell the old engine, the one that's giving you so much trouble, um, who, who, who's going to buy that? So the, the one option that's up there, um, there are brokers that specifically deal in, in selling used equipment. And there are departments that will take that equipment and may not need it to function as, for example, um, as a primary pumper. They may be purchasing it to use it as a blocker. Um, the, there's a new trend in the fire service actually to purchase these older vehicles in departments that run heavy, primarily interstate rescue operations. Um, and purchase an old apparatus that does have some weight to provide some blocking so that their newer apparatus are not getting destroyed on the interstate by. Yeah, you have to explain to me what blocking means. So when, when they're responding to a call on the interstate, they would actually park that truck back All right. okay. secondary to where they're at to allow responders to work inside of the safety zone there. So presumably then we could also sell the ladder truck for a lot more money than we could sell the engine. Yes. Because it's, it's, I mean, we're, we're in a community here where the, the tallest building is 35 feet. All of them are like that. I don't understand, um, and this is just my own opinion, I've never really understood why we spent so much money on a ladder truck in a community where we don't really have, we have no high rises, we have nothing, we have no big hotels or anything like that that we need to get up that high. So our ladder truck's actually required for us to have because we have buildings that it is 35 feet to the eaves. Um, ISO requires us to have one, otherwise we will see a major deduction in our ISO rating. So that has been, and by major deduction, we would go from, we're currently sitting at a three, we would probably go to a 9S. So for our commercial occupants, there's a potential there that they would lose all benefit and there would be some, some insurance reduction or insurance increases to uh, individual residences so as that's, well. That's what, well. That's what we're talking about, is, yes. is protecting that rating. <clears throat> it's interesting, too, picking up on a point that Rob just made, that we're going to get a cash discount of over 3%. We're sitting on cash now, and we're not making that in the bank. And we're limited as to what we could make. So right away, it's, you know, the discount is greater than we're going to make it by sitting it in the bank for two years. Yeah. And, and I mean, I don't see where any of our investments are generating more than, you know, no. 3.38. As, and as interest rates continue to move, and we're seeing a little bit of that, you saw that in your financial report um, from, from Ms. Barnes, um, interest, our interest returns are getting a little better. Um, still, two years, um, we're not going to see that kind of return on 750 in, in two years on interest. So, um, you know, We'll be sure, uh, working with the fire department, that there's the, the proper contractual language in place uh, to assure delivery. Um, we'll ask the fire department to be sure that we get a copy of the order before it's signed, because I'd want Mr. Hobbs to look at it. Um, 
ultimately it's the fire department's responsibility. Um, we're we're going to write a check, um, but they, they need to get a fire truck with it. Um, and I'll tell you, if this was uh, a new, one of the newer apparatus manufacturers that are out there, say that they've only been in business for 10 years, um, I wouldn't be here saying that we should do this. Pierce has been in business for a long time, and they're one of the top in the business. I, I would just say a couple of things. I mean, uh, you know, we have to, I, I think we have to take, uh, you know, the recommendation of the professional public safety people um, in, in mind when we make a decision, there's no doubt about it. We're not equipment or fire experts, and so that's what they get paid to do is make these recommendations to us. Procedurally, though, I would like to see some other things in the future, okay? Um, I would like to see, for example, what the last five years' maintenance costs have been so we can see what we've been spending on this to keep it in working order. And then, you know, to, to Mr. Mayor's point and your point, it would have been nice if we could have seen an analysis of what if we didn't pay up front but we did that money, what was the best investment we could have gotten so we can compare that and make a decision and say, well, even though it wouldn't have been as much, maybe we're still better holding the money or, you know what, it's so bad. Let's just buy it now. So, I mean, I think it would have been helpful to us if we had that information before us. But that, that would be just my comments procedurally. And, and of course, you look at the thank, price thank you for saying that. We, so we've looked at that, but we, you're right, we didn't. There wasn't part of the memo that we shared. Yeah, it would that, be helpful yeah. to us if, thank you. if we saw yeah. that. And, you know, um, Okay. Absolutely. Yes. And it's always, it's, and it's just, you know, again, this is just one other thing procedurally. It's always a little, um, it, it gets your hair up on your back a little bit when we have to make a decision by April 28th and it's already April 6th, you know. So anyway, right. just procedurally. And this three quarters of a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> not just the, yeah. not just a new park bench. Right. And so I, I will, I'm sorry. I was just going to say at the end of the day, we're going to have to replace either the truck or the engine. Right. And we're talking two years out, so that makes our newest piece of equipment 10 years old. So, you know, to save that kind of money, especially not to have to finance over 10 years, I think it makes a lot of good sense, especially since they got that price increase in there of $53,000. So I, I will say that the, the, the fire department, the, the leadership there, they put together a committee that does include some firefighters, not just, so not just officers. Um, and they've been working with the Pierce reps since, really since the retreat, um, to specify and build, basically build on paper a fire truck. So that, that took, it took, takes a lot of time, and I don't know how they did it as quickly as they did, but they were they were able to get a price because we we knew that we found out from from Pierce really in <coughs> March that this um, increase was going to happen at the end of April. So we were in hustle up mode. But you're right; it's 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 hurry up to make a really big decision. It's a hurry up to make a big decision. Yeah. yeah. Um, just on that point, um, town manager, uh, the uh, the fact that you had, we're building it to a particular specification for our community, uh, is there a fear that we have forgotten something and that we're not building it exactly the way you want, or do you feel like you had everything you needed to make the proper purchase? So Go ahead. We, we were able to put a very comprehensive um, committee together that included not only our career staff, but as well as some of our volunteers to make sure that we weren't missing any piece of it. Um, and we were very quick, deliberate, and direct in how we made some decisions. Um, there's several models locally that we were able to get a good look at. We had, I think everybody was really on board with a concept of where we were gonna go. Um, so then from there to be able to kind of shape it and fine tune it, we're, we're very comfortable with what we're presenting. Um, Great. And we have some of our members, our career members are volunteers elsewhere in, in Dare County that have gone through the process of specifying um, and ordering a fire truck very recently. So they, they've got that experience. Um, I won't stand here and promise that they haven't missed something. The fire department's gonna have to figure that out. Okay. Yeah, um, but you know they don't they don't start with a, a chassis and engine and six tires. It, it's there is a a stand a standard 
type of spec that the, you start building off of. And then it's a matter of being able to specify your pump and where you want your connections, how you want your seats configured and that kind of stuff. Right. And that's very specific to how um, the duck fire department Operate. operates. Great. Right. Yeah, and I think last time we did this, and uh, when we purchased the, the the first engine, we did have a committee go up to Pierce, and we had some very experienced uh, volunteers at the time because we didn't have that many, and it was even a decision if we were going with Pierce at that time. But a lot, like you say, a lot of things have already been pre-decided, so makes it more efficient. But thanks for answering. And, and while you're thinking, I'm just going to throw one more thing out. We, we hear criticism um, every once in a while that we have a lot of shiny, clean fire trucks. Um, and I guess the response to that is thank you. Um, so the deputy chief um, and the chief have an expectation that the equipment is clean. Um, and it's clean inside and out. Um, especially in this environment, they have to wash them all the time. Otherwise, they will. They'll kind of rust around them. So, yeah, they're, they're, they are very particular about how clean the fire trucks are. And that we're going to probably make the same decision in two months on the capital plan, understanding it's two years lead time for an engine. I'd like to make a motion that we go ahead and purchase the replacement for engine 11 and place the order prior to April 30th. At the same time, not allow the trade in, but look for a better opportunity over the next two years. So that'll be the motion on the floor. So it's open for discussion. Um, to your point, Mayor, on the uh, not trading it in, I'm, I'm, as I read it, there was no penalty for not making that decision at any time. I mean, when, when would be the latest we could make that decision about uh, trade in? So if we don't accept their trade in offer, we've made the decision that we're going to sell it at when we receive the other piece of apparatus in two years. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. They, they, could be the, they could be a buyer of it at that point, but it would not be a trade-in credit. So just a question then. Um, since 25 or something thousand dollars doesn't seem to be a lot for that truck, is it worth keeping it as a backup um, and putting any more money into it, or are we better to just have it gone? So one of the major issues with keeping it becomes storage. Okay. Um, it, it is because it's a fire apparatus, because it has a water tank, and because of the environment we live in, you wouldn't want to store it outside long term. Okay. Um, it may store outside overnight or if it, something yeah, yeah. were to occur in an interim type situation, but, but to store it outside would we would quickly begin to pay a lot more in maintenance. Okay, uh, makes sense. Time. Yeah. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? There being none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes five to zero. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, uh, True. Going on to the next item. Item D, discussion consideration of trash recycling cart rollout and rollback service. This time I think I'm going to turn it over to Tony because, Tony, you brought this up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I mean, in my, uh, in my speaking to people when I was campaigning and just hearing in general from people around town and so on, there, there's a lot of concern about cans that get put out and don't get rolled back in for several days um, after trash pickup and also a lot of trash being around the cans, um, you know, waiting, waiting for pickup. Um, and then s I've heard some people complain about rodent issues and they're kind of relating those, those items together. So in thinking about how to solve that problem, I mean, there are, there are options, uh, one of which is roll in, roll out. I mean, thinking through this, I mean, I would, I would assume that most of our problem is not people who are here most of the time because they put them out and they, they pull it in. But when we have properties where people are not there all the time and maybe it's rented this week but it's not the next week or whatever, the cans can stay out on the street. It's a particularly bad problem, I think, along Beach Road. And also, it's, it's certainly not, an, it's not aesthetically pleasing to see cans out on the street for several days on end. So my thought was, should we consider uh, a town-wide um, roll-in, roll-out service? Now, I know 
Nag's Head is doing it, I think, along the beach road, if I'm, if I'm right. And I think Southern Shores is doing it along Ocean Boulevard. Um, so I just wanted to, to raise the issue and see if there was interest in it or if it's a, or if it's a, a possible solution. The other thing is, I mean, I know we technically, or I think technically, we could issue a summons. I think we could. Uh, I don't know if we want to have our police, you know, enforcing garbage can violations, you know, <laughs> but we could. Um, the, um, uh, the rental companies, we could make them responsible in some way, shape, or form for doing it. I mean, there are options we have, but I just wanted to throw that out to get a discussion going and see what, what people's you know, feelings were and, and what options were and how we might prioritize them. But it was, I think, a big enough issue raised by enough people that we should, we should talk about it. Drew, do you want to highlight kind of some of your background information that you came up with? I know that Southern Shores um, has been talking about this, and I, Robert just told me that they approved to do a pilot. He was at their meeting last night. I, have not, I did not get a chance to talk to Cliff. Yeah, the, um, the, uh, at the meeting last night, the town council uh, provided, authorized some funds for the town manager to initiate his pilot program for the summer uh, for certain of the uh, oceanfront uh, properties along uh, ocean. Uh, Boulevard there. So um, anyway, they, they have a contractor, they had a, a price, and so they elected to. Robert, are they only rolling back off the road? Yeah, they don't, just a few feet back off the road or right. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember the details. Is That's it the way Nags Head's doing it as well, <clears throat> because it's, you know, the idea that their sidewalk is, and Nags Head sidewalk on the beach road, you know, people weren't even sure where to put it. Should right. I put it inside or outside the sidewalk? In Southern Shores, I was at one of their planning board meetings where they were coming up with this idea of um, perhaps doing it on Ocean Boulevard for the public safety aspects of the cans and the mm -hmm. debris coming out of the cans um, where the property manager, and so they decided to do something. The public works was one idea that they have their own public works, but it looks as though they've maybe gone with a private contractor. And again, just on the Ocean Boulevard, uh, I think up to Hickory is what your notes say. So not even, you know, just really in the zone of the busier road. Um, certainly we have that we have that area as well that's busy and uh, doesn't need to be impeded by trash cans. And so there's the concern of adequate cans. And I know that Southern Shores talked about that and Nagset addresses it. Oh, not to speak for you, I'm reading your report now, but uh, they address it by taxing the, the folks um, by bedroom or by capacity so that, um, you know, because you have to have a certain number of cans. So there is a, a fee that each of these towns is going to be uh, taxing their these individuals along the, the roadway. Um, well, charging as opposed to taxing. Well, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, but the, um, I mean, if it was the, a tax, we'd all be paying it, but they're, they're charged, yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, you're right. There is a, there's a fee for that. Uh, in terms of um, property management companies getting involved, uh, education is always something they can do, but any kind of um, penalties would have to go to the homeowner. The t property management companies uh, would not be uh, eligible to be penalized, uh, as I understand that. Um, but uh, education is certainly something that every property manager tries to do uh, with the turnover. Um, and I think some of this was exacerbated uh, by the staggered uh, pickup that we had, yeah. where um, at least we're down to the original uh, Monday and uh, Thursday pickup again, Monday and Friday. Is it? Robert, did they, is the town paying for the pilot or? And can people opt out of the pilot? I believe the towns can pay for it. Is paying for it? Yes, sir. And can people opt out of the pilot? That wasn't discussed. And one thing I never mentioned, uh, you know, we have a number of HOAs in this community, in our town. I think the HOAs have more responsibility for this than the town or the uh, management companies, real estate companies. I'm okay with that too. I just think we need to, you know, find what the focus point is to, to make it happen. But I, uh, yeah. 
I would agree with that. Because like in our homeowners association, association, we pay for roll in and roll out. That's the decision we made. Some have decided not to, but I think if you decide not to, you have to have a process whereby the cans are getting off the street. I, I agree. You know, yeah. Yeah, I think the last person in the line is the town. Right. I, you know, I think the first person is the person who owns the property and either secondarily then perhaps their property management company or the HOA. Uh, I think the town is third in line in that one. Uh, I know particularly in our Tucker Homeowners, Homeowners Association, you know, we're starting with education and educating the property owners that, you know, either you or in fact your renters and your, your property management companies need to get the cans out and off the road. Yeah, and so. I think, Monica, I think you made the point too that having the right number of cans is important. Some houses may not have the right number of cans, which is exacerbating the trash around the community problem. Um, I think it can be a neighborly thing as well, uh, whether you decide that you want to roll your neighbor's can in or call the number on the house if it is a rental house so that you can alert the property management company that this is, you know, needs to be addressed. They should they should be very reactive. Um, it's it's a tough it's a tough um, job out there to collect the trash. And um, I know personally for our company we have a a person who just that's what they do all week is just pick up excess trash on a trailer because it just can get out of hand in the summer. Um, so we try to and if someone calls us, we're all over it. So that that helps when you do call a property management company. And I noticed, Drew, looking at your letter, if we did service all the residential address points in Duck, we might as well buy another fire truck. Yeah. Based upon the, uh, the dollar year. estimate. Every year. <laughs> I mean, three to seven hundred thousand dollars. We don't have that kind of money. That's just, that's just doing the simple math using what Nag said. That's assuming you want to do it 12 months a year. Oh, yeah. But either way, we'd have to have either a trade-off and something we're currently doing and or a tax increase. That's pretty safe to say. Well, I'd just like to tack on to this conversation and say that I think it's um, that education in general about trash and about um, the environment uh, to the community. Uh, we have a hugely transient population coming in here all summer, even the, even our second prop, uh, you know, folks that don't live here all year round, educating them as to what exactly can go into a recycling container is something I'd really like to focus on. Um, it's very simple, one and two plastic, clean paper, glass, tin, and uh, not much else, I'm probably missing one thing, but it's just that people, it's amazing what people think, is this maybe recyclable? And then they put it in the recycling can. There's, and if you're in doubt, just don't uh, recycle it because it just contaminates the recycling. But you know, that's something that I think is super important. And also just getting an, an adequate number of cans. If someone finds a habitually you know, problem with uh, you know, trash that's overflowing, it's a no-brainer to just get more cans. And uh, that's, again, something that you can call the property management company on uh, and, and, and let, get them to help if you see that problem. So um, we all have to be our eyes and ears out there um, and be part of the solution, I think. And well, education I, I, is going to be. I'm, I'm good with that, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm great with education. I just don't know who we're going to educate and how we're going to educate them, because every week we have 30,000 different different people in the town of Duck. So the ones you educated this week are gone, and there's a whole other group in that you haven't educated. So how do we, you know, how do we do this? And to me, it goes back to the property owners and the property management association and the homeowners association. Yeah. I mean, and I think we have to, you know, have, have staff come up with a program that addresses those three constituencies and make them responsible for it. And I think it can be a real simple message, the QR codes, and, and our staff has worked really hard on, on going back to the old schedule and the QR codes that people are, you know, getting into that, um, and then maybe just making it very a very simple message, like one, two, three, you know, 
this is it. Uh, these are the days, this is what you can put in the can. Uh, roll in, roll out. It's gotta be super basic. You can come up with a jingle, I don't know. Um, something, but you're right. It is a huge um, intake uh, and undertaking. Uh, as I've said before, uh, we've taken to texting uh, uh, all of them, and it's since managing in all the several towns, it's a whole grid that I have to keep up with the, in terms of what the days are and all that. But it, texting that visitor the night before saying, don't forget to put your can out has really helped. But every company doesn't have that ability. Um, if we had a, you know, we could maybe do that with the broadcasting to anybody who's on our, but it's not like an emergency broadcast. So you kind of want to save those for the evacuation. <laughs> but there are ways to get that message out. Um, and it's just continually trying to innovate. And thanks for the, all the staff work so far. It's kind of interesting that two towns that are doing this, they're just taking them off the major thoroughfares. I mean, they're not going into the neighborhoods like where our problem is, is in the neighborhoods. I don't see it on Route 12, it's in the neighborhoods. So well, that's a whole different is. subject. But I think some, and I'll go back to what Tony and Monica were just saying, I think if we could put together some education, you know, maybe one is property owners, maybe two is HOAs, and maybe three is property management companies, explain the issue and what the expectations are. That's perhaps where we start. Any further ideas or discussion? So I guess nobody wants a tax increase then? I guess not. And nobody wants to what? A tax increase. Oh, <laughs> a fee, a fee. <laughs> a fee, yeah. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next item, which uh, a discussion by Council of Beach Accesses. Uh, I'll start the discussion now we've heard from uh, Mr. Hovey and uh, Marion Rollins. Today we've heard uh, from several other homeowners. We've heard both sides of this discussion. Uh, we put it on the agenda this evening because we kind of were accused of saying we would discuss it at a future meeting and with court cases and everything else that was going on, we never really had a, a discussion with council. So tonight we put it on the agenda and uh, I guess I would like to maybe highlight some of the things, open it up for discussion uh, with council. Um, and also obviously staff. Um, but I think we heard from Mr. Hovey tonight, and obviously he wants beach access in Clover. I think if he wants to pursue that, my own opinion, but this seems to be a separate case. I mean, the Supreme Court has upheld the Court of you know, Appeal saying there's no public access in Duck. And if he wants to continue to pursue that, I don't think their town has any role in that. I think that's a personal thing that in fact he would have to pursue himself, you know, on a legal basis. Um, but secondly, with respect to uh, the policing, you know, we do have the ability. Uh, we're gonna take a look at that, I guess, with respect to the chief and the, and the town manager about whether or not we really wanna arrest people for trespassing, but we certainly could do it for other reasons, disturbing the peace or anything along those lines. Um, parking is basically, complaint driven at this point in time. I don't think we have the staff to enforce parking on every street if it's not complaint driven. Once again, these are my personal opinions. And with respect to the beach access at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, people have to understand that is not a viable option. Our town manager, maybe perhaps you'd like to brief us on your latest conversation with them. But we have to look at the Corps of Engineers. It's almost being a U.S. military fort. It's not what it was 20 or 30 years ago. It's a lot different today. They did a lot of remediation. You've, they've got now fencing down on the, both the north and south sides. Uh, perhaps going to move the gate and put more fencing in. Um, perhaps, Drew, you could just brief us on your conversation with the Corps. Sure. I, so I, I talked with the facility manager there, um, Dr. Waters, and just asked mainly I, I want a history because we keep hearing that this area used to be open to the public for beach access. And he did confirm that prior to 9-11-2001, people were permitted to park in that parking lot by the gazebo, um, walk over the access that we currently use for our lifeguard service. Um, and it was primarily surfers. Um, and it was not, 
something that was advertised. There was no signs that said can park here. There was no signs that said public access. It was just something understood in what was then a much smaller community. Um, after 9-11, um, the military, which this is a military installation, um, said we're going to secure everything. So the gate was put up. Um, they did conduct tours. Um, people likely remember that there was a time when you could get a tour of, of the FRF. Um, Burdick, which is the, the next level up in the chain of command of the field research facility, um, at one point had funded an intern to do tours. Um, that funding went away. The facility scientists kept doing the tours until it became overly burdensome and detracted from their work. Subsequently, they, they stopped doing the regular, regular tours of the facility. Um, so it was never open as a picnic shelter. It was never really open as a, as a place where people could come park their car and leave. Um, I asked very specifically, what are the odds? Um, I won't use this, the same phrasing, but basically, no way. Um, the, the Army um, is moving to make things more secure in their facilities, uh, and, this, and not less. Um, this facility does do science that is available to researchers worldwide, um, but they also support the warfighting effort um, some, with some of their research, and some of it is um, not something they want the public to be around. So, we could chase this up the chain of command um, with, you know, through ERDIC, uh, through the core um, command, you know, up into Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm willing to do that if so directed. I can tell you what the answer is going to be. And I think you all probably can guess what the answer is going to be. Thank you, Drew. And just to go through Mrs. Rollins' comments, uh, we appreciate the, uh, the petition we got from the 94 individuals and the 52 properties. Um, we'll certainly enforce parking on a complaint basis. I think that we need to have more discussion internally with respect to arresting for trespassing. And I think that is one that we will give to the town manager and the police chief to, to have a discussion. Um, we really can't do much with respect to, you know, the illegal access there. I mean, if, if Hovey wants to pursue it, he's obviously can pursue it through the courts, but I think certainly, as you explained, Mrs. Rollins, it's pretty much set by the North Carolina Supreme Court and the public uh, courts of North Carolina. Um, and the other, the other point you made, and that is communicating to the rental agencies that have, uh, that are in Osprey Ridge, I guess, and, and using that, you know, we could send a, uh, an informational piece to them from the town, but we don't really have any enforcement action to have them take down their advertisements. Uh, but we could do something on that basis. So th th those are some of my comments, my personal opinions. Uh, I've been with this, there was this, some of the others on this council hub for many years, but I'm gonna open up now for any further discussion that, that council members would like to add to this discussion. Um, well, go ahead, Tony. I, I would I would like to say first of all that I mean I think we have um, I think the town of Duck has has made it clear that we don't have any public beach access, and that horse left the barn many many years ago. You know it's private property. Um, there's nothing available at this point. It is what it is. So regardless of what the town may or may not think, there's there's nothing we can we can do about the issue. Second thing I would say is we should not make this a personal issue, okay? I know feelings run, run high on the issue and people are on different sides of it and they both feel passionately about it, but let's just keep focused on the issue and not personalities and, and all that. Because we want, we want everyone in this community to get along and enjoy being here and running into each other at events on the street and not feeling bad about that. So, I mean, I, I, I would hope that we could do that. Um, again, everything in Duck on the ocean is private property. A court ruling has affirmed that, and it's affirmed on appeal the same thing, and the walkways uh, are, not, are not for the public. 
it establishes the law. Doesn't matter what our opinion is. You know, that's, that's the law. Um, I would say, I mean, I may differ a little than the mayor. I mean, I'm not, look, I'm, not, I'm not looking forward to, you know, posting people over there to have everybody arrested who walks by. But I think people have a right to expect that their private property rights will be protected by law enforcement in the town. I mean, I think, I think we have an obligation to do that. Um, Mr. Hovey has asked us to tell us whether we're going to arrest him if he goes on the property. I mean, I don't think we have to answer that question. It's not our decision, it's his decision. If he wants to violate private property law, he is making himself subject to whatever the laws are and what people may do uh, in light of that. And if someone has a complaint about trespassing, the police have to respond to it. Um, and the person, you know, should know what the consequences are. Um, Our town manager talked about communications with, with the FRF facility. You know, there's no hope there, it doesn't sound like, at this point in time. But I would encourage Mr. Hovey to speak to his federal representative and senator and see if through them he can get some action there. It's not hopeful, but he certainly could pursue that if he, if he so wanted. Um, I don't think... Um, you know, we've had, we've had, I don't want to say threats, but, you know, insinuations that the town of Duck will be looked at as a very bad place because we don't have public access to our beaches. I think that's an unfair characterization, um, you know, that, that, that is holding the town accountable for something that it has nothing it can do about. Uh, and I don't think that, I don't think that will, that will happen. Um, so, I mean, I think if, if there's, from my perspective and my opinion, there's nothing the town of Duck can do beyond what it's doing. It is what it is, the law is what it is. And if there are two parties that disagree and one party can't negotiate, then they can go to court again if they want. But I think we already know the answer to that, to that pursuit. But that's my opinion. It's, it's you know, there's, there doesn't seem to be anything the town can do at this point. Private property is private property, and it is what it is. I agree with you, Tony. I think this is, uh, this is kind of a dead issue as far as we're concerned. Um, and whether or not Mr. Hovey is sincere in his pursuit of this, he didn't even stay for the discussion that he asked us to put on the agenda. So... Yeah. I think we're done with it. Yeah, I don't think I don't think there's any more we can do about it. Well, I'll make a few points on this, and uh, I just I totally agree with you, uh, Tony, that um, Mr. Hovey is passionate about this. He feels that uh, he's, you know, right. Um, and the town of Duck, when we were faced with the um, issue on Seabreeze was um, standing by on the sidelines waiting to abide by the law, what the law decided. Um, we uh, were caught, you know, kind of in, you know, uh, with uh, some things on the website that had to be adapted just as things were happening <coughs> back then, and we've landed on where what the website says. Uh, and, uh, and and that waited for the uh, final appeals, if you will, and and, it, and it's maintained that um, that's a private access. Um, I don't disagree. I've been here a long time myself. That um, well, obviously things have changed over the last uh, 30 years, um, and uh, things are more um, developed and more. Uh, there's you know. Uh, a little bit comp more complicated. Things were a little bit looser, obviously, before 9-11, and, and things have changed at the field re research facility over time uh, that have tightened things up um, to the point where we've been trying for, I don't know, five, six years to allow a, a new fire station. And so we see the difficulty in getting through the bureaucracy of the field research facility, and we want to kind of keep on their good side while we work to get a new public safety building. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say that that doesn't open a door for future discussions and, and who knows what could happen down the road. But yes, uh, with the complicated world that we're living in, the amount of attention and worldwide that's focused on that research and that facility, um, 
you know, the idea that uh, just anybody can go on it is, is tough, um, you know, is, is, um, is hard. Um, yeah, have people always been able to walk to the beach and not have a problem and for years and years? Absolutely. Uh, and um, is there nothing that the town can do? No, the town could do a few things. The town, in its purview, could, could uh, offer to purchase uh, one or two oceanfront properties. We know what those go for. Um, and, you know, get you just a... just bought a fire truck. What are you cracking up? What's that? <laughs> What a fire truck. We can't afford it. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. We can't afford it. But, uh, I mean, you know, it's not like they can't do anything. I mean, yes, we can look for a, a property um, and, and, then, and then say to that community, hey, guess what? We're going to put an access. And, and believe me, we've talked about it over the years. There was a property that was condemned before nourishment, and we kind of looked at that one because there was some parking nearby that we could have... Not that we would have an eminent domain or anything, but those conversations have happened over the years, you know, to uh, to, to purchase something that had been condemned, and uh, but you know it wasn't pursued. But the money was a big issue at the time. It, we knew that you know it would be a little bit tight, uh, tough on that community. Some uh, and there have been um, established, you know communities for well before we were a town that are, are you know, where these, these communities have the uh, private accesses. Um, you know, and then and then we became we got some public streets. You know, some of those communities are so old they don't have formal HOAs, and there's many of them in the town. Uh, gave their streets uh, their t um, streets to the uh, to the DOT and DOT. Um, you know, we were wondering how that would affect the easement, and you know, it it, it didn't affect the easement. It was the street itself that kind of became uh, the way that happened. But that was just for maintenance purposes. So. Um, you know, there is a lot of history. Things have evolved. Um, things that we could do are beyond practicality, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not like we can't do anything. Um, and uh, we do follow the law. Um, in terms of the, um, I think, uh, in terms of the police, uh, I think the idea of, of parking violations on complaints are, you know, is a, is a, uh, is a thing that makes sense. Um, I don't know about the trespassing because I think it just. Uh, but you know, but we can let we can see what the town manager and the police chief think about about those things and get get some opinions from them on on the practicalities of that and just the uh, view. But I think a larger issue for our community is the fact that yes, we're we're grown and we're about built out, and there are several streets in Duck that do not have deeded beach access. You know, Jay Crest, uh, some of those folks, um, when Ocean Crest was developed, they were able to jump onto the, um, onto the, they were invited by Ocean Crest, and some people opted in and some people didn't. So some of Jay Crest has got deeded access and some of it doesn't. Nantucket was invited into Ocean Crest when they platted it, and uh, they didn't want to participate. So Nantucket's one of those folks that doesn't have deeded beach access. Um, Osprey Ridge, um, the, the duck, uh, um, uh, the uh, settlers landing. Maybe they have it across the street. I'm not sure, but certainly the the other community right next to Schooner Ridge um, doesn't have deeded access, and probably the um, houses that are along Duck that are not part of a subdivision don't either. Um, in other words, there are some you know community, some neighbors of ours that don't have a way to get to the beach, and so I I think that one thing we could do is encourage neighbors to talk to neighbors and see if there's things that they can work out um, I, uh, you know, between them so that people can walk to the beach, certainly don't need to park down there, maybe drop off, but it is um, something that I would like to encourage and figure out um, ways to maybe get some communication going. When Osprey Ridge was developed, it was a big red flag for me that they didn't work toward that. Same with the one next to Schooner. It's like you've got a brand new subdivision and you're not thinking about beach access. It, it was, I, I couldn't understand it, but... Um, I think it's you know neighborly to let people walk across your boardwalk to get to the uh, public ocean, but um, you can't um, you can't tell people what to do. So it would be nice if people could work together and so that our neighbors in Duck could get to the beach. But 
and in terms of just helping to facilitate those conversations, not sure if the town has a role, but we could certainly try to try to work that out uh, if people are willing and interested in, in some kind of conversation on that. Um, so those are my thoughts. Uh, there's really, uh, you know, we're bound by the law and uh, current situation. I think everything that I have to say has been said already, and I'm not going to bore everybody with it over again. Any other comments by council? I think through a couple action items, one is I know you and the police chief are going to discuss this whole trespassing issue and how you're going to handle it. Um, I think the other thing is, and whatever we can do within our purview, and I know we don't have responsibility here out of at least advising those rental companies that they're misadvertising. And you and I talked about that a little bit, and I guess there's something we could do on a, on a, on a basis, but you know, we're not the enforcers on that. Is there anything else that we want to give direction to staff on? No, I mean, I just, I just would, I, I mean, I know we may have a difference of opinion on this. I'm not looking to arrest anybody. Yeah. But private property owners only have one recourse to make sure their property is private if someone keeps wanting to go across it, and that is to call the law enforcement people and have them engage with them. Um, otherwise, they don't have private property anymore. Um, so, I mean, and people, and, and, and if someone is doing that purposely, to raise an issue, they know what the way is to deal with that, it's take it to court. You know, going there and getting arrested every day is not gonna solve your issue. Um, so, but, but uh, if, if it is private property and it's for the enjoyment of the people of that development, they have the right to have that remain as private property. And since we don't want people taking the law into their own hands, I think we have a, an obligation here. Just my opinion. Just one other thing I'm thinking of it. Do we need any revisions on our website with respect to our, our comments with respect to beach access, or is, do you think that might be sufficient? You, you don't have to answer that now, but if we need to make any changes to that. We'll, we'll take another look at it. It's I probably sufficient. It the town does not own or maintain any yeah, it beach looked, access. Yeah, it looked good to me, yeah. but. So, yeah. Christian, Christian Gary, the conversation Mayor, if I could uh, say something. Yes, sir. Um, we're prepared to give advice to staff on all the issues that have been discussed um, and more. And so uh, we'll be happy to initiate that process. Um, we certainly have uh, opinions about 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 all these issues and can certainly discuss those in depth with staff to make sure that, you know, that the town operates properly and within its authority uh, because the town <coughs> operates by statute and only has the authority that it's given by the state legislature. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank and I know you have all the latest documentation, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for that discussion, Council. Now we're going to go on item number seven, items referred to and presentations from the town attorney. Herbert? Uh, Mayor, I don't have anything to tonight. Thank you, sir. And item number eight, items referred to and presentations from the town manager. We'll go to the uh, department updates. Uh, Deputy Chief Batchelet will be the uh, fire update. Jim Gould will do community development. We'll do police. Christian will do PIO, and then Jessica will do finance, and then I'll Thank you. Issue was important tonight, right? Some things I'm good at. That's I'll give them a. I'll give that a second. That's what time. we should do. We should put those issues at the end all the time. All right, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council members, and folks in the audience still in attendance here. Um, I will make this as brief as possible. We do want to thank you for your consideration of the fire engine. Um, we will certainly work diligently on that and continue our efforts. Um, so I'm here tonight to do just our quick up, our brief monthly update here for the month of March. I'll jump right into this with calls for service. Uh, 
just this is again just showing March how we've trended over the past five years. You can see we had the little dive there in 2020. Obviously, we were closed, um, and then 2021 was the year that never ended. Uh, so we had a little up. We are starting to see that level out. Um, what you will notice on this next slide, though, is when we show our year to date numbers in March across the past five years. Um, we are trending back up again. So while we were a little lower in March this year, we are still trending realistically on par with, uh, with last year. Um, moving right in just to show that kind of breakdown comparison of where we varied a little from last year. Um, one less medical call. Uh, we didn't have a mutual aid call in the month of March. That's very rare for us actually. Uh, and then you can see the, the differences in public service calls, uh, no motor vehicle crashes this year. Um, we did have two fires this year in March though, so the guys were happy about that. Um, and again, just that breakdown there of uh, uh, how all of that compares on that pie chart, you can see that our, our medical is still holding at, right at just above 50%. Um, for the month, we had 521 total training hours. Um, our career members accounted for 399 of those and our volunteers accounted for 122. And the rest of this presentation is really just gonna walk through kind of what our activities have been to include some of our training. We were very heavy in training. We had an opportunity through our partnership with the town. Um, Sandy is, is very good at getting us the ability to train in some structures that they're going to be tearing down. So Sandy Ridge, we had the opportunity to train in a building. We made a joint training out of it where we brought our mutual aid partner in Southern Shores up. Um, this allows for all of us to work together and provides additional credit, as I talked about earlier with the ISO piece. Um, it's, it's a huge integral part of all of that. So uh, we did our annual live burn training in Buxton. We were able to create something that we've never been able to create before and that we were able to get most of our staff down on a single day, um, which was great. We could work together very well uh, and we couldn't pull that off without our mutual aid partners again that came down and supported us in that. It was another opportunity to train with those same partners of Southern Shores and Kitty Hawk. Um, in addition to that, we, were, we worked with the county on a special events emergency planning tabletop exercise down at the, uh, the EOC. Um, we had a couple of members attend fire inspector class, uh, a couple of members attend some fire officer classes, three members attend uh, fire instructor classes, some fire life safety educator stuff, and then of course we have our departmental driver operator training that occurs every day. Um, additionally, we had Engine 11, the replacement committee, truck committee come together for that. Um, they, and they did about six months of work in three to four weeks worth of time. Um, couldn't have been done without them. What you're seeing there is not a representation. The chief took a picture of a drawing that we were using as a reference drawing to look at some ideas from. So one thing that we're able to do is pull some of these drawings from different areas and different vehicles that have been built and get ideas and that's how we kind of are able to, to lay out something that we're very, very confident in moving forward. Uh, the last thing was really a huge effort by everyone. So we talked about ISO a little bit earlier. Uh, we were able on actually this past Monday, we completed our ISO inspection. Uh, we're on a five year cycle. We get reinspected every five years. It was easy because of the membership support that we have. Um, all of our staff really pitched in and picked up the slack. It was a true team effort. Um, we were able to, to collect everything and kind of navigate the process as seamlessly as possible. Um, our current rating is a three. Um, we'll know our results from our rating that we just had in a few weeks. They say 30 to 60 days is what it takes to get it back. Um, there's a little bit of a process for where it has to go to come back to us. But uh, I did get an inclination that we would maintain what we had. So uh, we, what, we feel very the, good about what's it. What's the highest rating? The highest rating is a one. And in the state of North Carolina, to my knowledge, there are three or four ones, and they are gonna be, Greensboro I know is a one, um, Charlotte's an example of a one, Apex, Apex is a one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and, and you can ask Drew how much it costs to be a one. Um, and so that was really all I have for the night. Are there any further questions? No, I'm glad you got out yep. to do so much. Thank, thank you, Deputy Chief. Yeah, thank you. I would just say that, by the way, Chief, you know, you, resp you folks responded to a, a false fire alarm next to me, next door to me last week. And I don't know if you were out there or not. I don't think you were, but um, yeah, everybody was very professional. The response was great, very helpful. The neighbor wasn't there. They were away. Gave the, the, the officer in charge the information. He contacted. I mean, they really did a nice job. Very professional. Well, thank you. Very well done. Thank you. We yeah. work hard to, to keep that going. Thank you. Um, my slides should be in the Z drive there under Joe's presentation. It's up on screen. Uh, that's not it. That's Kay's presentation. Oh, I think I'm trying to manipulate the mouse while, while you are. I've got it. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I had it in the wrong area there, Christian. All right, well, good evening. Good evening. Um, in Joe's absence, I have a uh, taken on this role this evening to present to you the Department of Community Development's presentation. Um, Mayor, members of council, and the rest of the members of the audience, um, here we go. All right, so we'll start out with permit activity. Um, permit activity, as you see down in the totals, down at the very bottom, actually remained the same from last year to this year. And uh, basically any reductions in building permits that we experienced in March were made up for in trade permits. So uh, things were very similar to uh, February and identical to last year in March. So we're right on track there. In terms of where we're seeing some activity, um, it's kind of all across the board. North of the pier spread out um, fairly well. And then south of the pier, it's, it's really just a complete splattering of activity you know, all ramping up, I think, for the uh, rental season, or the, the warmer months that lie ahead, should we say, so when everybody's getting excited. We did have a few substantial renovations and new homes um, go under development this month, one of which is pictured there at 134 Old Duck. It's a four bedroom, single family dwelling, and they're gonna have a nice pool in the backyard, so. Um, those guys were hard at work. That's actually today, so up there, enjoying the nice weather, getting some work done. We've been fairly busy in the uh, department with a couple special use permits that have come through, and just recently the, we worked with the Board of Adjustments to take the, a variance through over at um, 1170 Duck Road that had to deal with uh, building a pool in the backyard, um, essentially, to put it simply. And we do have a special permit going through to the planning board, uh, which we do encourage the public to come and attend that planning board meeting on the 13th of April, so next Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. And it deals with the redevelopment of the resort realty property at sort of the, the northern extent of our local village commercial district here. Um, and this property, here's a nice rendering for what may come, oh, um, the, the upper that. portion there is, uh, you know, they've, they've gone through great lengths to provide us with buildings that should fit aesthetically with the, uh, the look that we're trying to achieve here in the Village Commercial District. And as you see, it's, not, it's no longer one building, it's, it's three. There's gonna be a restaurant on the far southern portion of the lot with mixed use development and the other two buildings um, to the right of it. Uh, with retail space on the bottom floors and living space above. And yes, that would um, front the sound there nicely wow. and uh, may include some boardwalks that you know, could potentially become accessible um, through a public easement just to the north of that, which we're looking into. 
The retaining wall <laughs> replacement by Millstone Marine has, has gone phenomenally well. Um, they've had some good weather days and they've moved along pretty much done with the project. Um, there's a few remaining items. This is the, the wall just north, or sorry, that's the finished product of the wall just north of the Duckfield Research Facility at the crest of the hill. Um, so that portion is done. We will do some plantings and some landscaping, some stabilization will occur there to get things um, looking pretty as spring comes along. This was the older section between Pintail Drive and Wood Duck uh, before it got removed. Here's part of the removal process. And they put up quite a nice um, roof structure there. We're waiting on the shingles to finish off that project. Um, but they, they include some nice architectural detail. I think they went a, a little bit above and beyond, uh, but for the same price to get us that, that good look there. There's also a nice bench that they installed. Um, it's about 12 feet long. We're gonna have some bike racks there that are yet to come. There's, the, the water fountain is gonna be reinstalled on that site, so you'll be able to get a drink of water. And actually, there's a vacant lot right across the street, so it is a good spot to uh, sit and have that moment of repose at the end of your, uh, your bike ride there or maybe in the middle of your bike ride. I don't know how many people would be ending their bike ride in that particular location. And there's Miss Sandy Cross having her moment of repose and uh, enjoying the new pavers that were also installed by uh, Coin Jack Lawn Care. So overall, pretty pleased with this project. Uh, the beach grading is probably going to be completed in the area that was re-nourished by this weekend. Um, I will mention that we've had a lot of requests for grading areas in areas outside of the areas that are receiving the beach re-nourishment. So um, we do not typically grade those areas. Um, now, you can do alternatives in those areas that, are, that do not require a camera permit, like installing a simple post and rail structure or a post and rope structure. So there's no issue there with a camera permit, but of course you can always call us for advice on what those uh, structures look like. Uh, but all in all, it's going very well. And uh, yeah, I think we'll... Um be ready for the summer traffic. Beach planting completed uh, last week um, with, uh, we had 21 plantings. Sorry, I can't quite read my own thing there. 21 plantings, 93,900 sprigs installed. And um, I will say that Duck Sweep has started and Duck Sweep and the beach planting are just great ways for people to get to know their neighbors, get to know their community members. We've, since I've been here since November, Sandy has invited new members of our community out and they show up and they, they start to become friends with the people that are at these plantings. And I'd like to see the same thing occur at, at Duck Sweep um, since it is now kicked off. But uh, I mean, just a, a great a feel good event that really serves an excellent purpose of, of protecting our beaches and uh, you know stopping some of that or at least mitigating some of that sediment transport so to protect our homes. Um, the Resilient Coastal Communities program is a program that we got involved with um, back in 2001 and we were chosen by the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management to take part in this project and we are now entering about to enter phase three. We're nearing the completion of phase two. And throughout this project, we've always sought public input. And now we are about to get to the point where we're going to release on our website with the help of Christian Legner um, an, an interpretive map that's going to allow our citizens and members of the public to prioritize what resiliency projects they think sh should come first. So a resiliency, we've got about 22 resiliency projects outlined, um, anything from uh, stormwater management in neighborhoods when it comes to potentially or basically rainfall in neighborhoods. We've got um, septic tank monitoring as one of the proposals. We've got um, a climate adaptation plan as one of the proposals. So those are just some of the things that will be available for the public to review here um, over the next week probably. I hope that we'll be able to get that up online. So. It's exciting um, as we move to phase two. Uh, we really want to encourage that input. And then lastly, Duck Sweep, like I said, has occurred. We don't, we haven't been using this logo, I think, too often, but I like it. It's very cute. Um, and 
maybe the cuteness will encourage more people to come out. So uh, if you are a member of the public and you're thinking about joining us on Duck Sweep, please reach out to me at jgould at townofduck.com and we will get you signed up or I will. And uh, yeah, that occurs every Friday and the time changes throughout the summer to adapt to the changing light conditions and the, the inclement weather that basically means hot weather sometimes as the summer goes on. So that is all for my presentation. And uh, if anyone else, or if anyone has any questions, I'd like to take them. You had 21 plantings and they plant 5,000 plants per planting. I think you're a little low on your number there. <laughs> I am not sure that we did 5,000 I mean, every 5, planting. Every time. Mm -hmm. I grew up 5,000 every time. Oh. <laughs> and, and just to note, we did have one uh, community member basically lead his own planting, oh, yeah, which was, nice. I, I think, excellent. That's sort of what we want to see occur in our community is we encourage that, um, that growth, you know, aside from the staff taking it on. You know, really create stewards throughout the community. It's excellent. Yeah, that worked out. Thank you. Thank so you, Jim. Much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I thought felt like Joe was back. It was great. <laughs> All right. Um, first, I want to start off here. This would advance. Sorry. Well, if you could, are you able to advance it? Is that what was working? We always have some technical difficulties. So anyway, until the slide comes up. Um, first thing I wanted to talk about is how well we did with our GovDeals auctions um, in disposing of the, the uh, three surplus vehicles as well as a whole plethora of other things that we had. Um, we tend to, to amass uh, surplus over time and at some point it was just time to get rid of it so we did that. This was our annual sale. Um, did exceptionally well with the vehicles and while the used car market is certainly through the roof right now, I don't think that was the sole uh, issue. We, we've always done really good disposing of vehicles. We tend to keep them uh, in good running order, take care of them, wash them off, and, and it definitely has a, a return effect. So we were able to recoup about 47% of the original acquisition price on our vehicles. And these are six-year-old vehicles, some of them with over 100,000 miles. So uh, national average is below 30%. So we did well. Um, Gov deals allows us to reach a really wide market. So vehicles we sold went to Georgia, Florida, and Charlotte. So um, people are certainly willing, and, and they were all repeat buyers. So they were happy with what they got in the past and ended up uh, coming back. So uh, our projection for the year for sales was right at um, $30,000. And I'm sorry, we ended up with $57,796. So we well above projections, did very well. So um, certainly not enough to buy a fire truck, but it helps. <laughs> it helps. And I was glad to, to, you know, I thought I was in bad shape. Ford notified us this week that there was somewhere around a 13-month lead time for police vehicles. So two years a little worse for fire. I had a great opportunity to go up to D.C. and attend uh, International Association of Chiefs Police function. That uh, was a, a three-day training and workshop on planning, designing, and constructing police fa uh, facilities. Really was a, a great opportunity. Wasn't sure what I was going to get out of it, but had the opportunity to network with people from all across the country, as well as to go out and tour three recently constructed facilities of different sizes. Um, just learned a, a Things I would have never thought of in a million years when you're when you're looking at these types of projects and what needs to go in them. Um, so really getting to go and and put eyes on 
uh, uh, one of the facilities was 75% done. And hearing from the chief there and their construction managers about the pitfalls they ran into, things that they wish they'd have done, things that they thought of that, that I never had, and then certainly getting to talk to folks from across the country. So really was a great opportunity. Um, we got the new LPR system in. We hope to get it put up um, within the next week or so. It's going to it'll be a temporary pole erected uh, right at Sandy Ridge Road there. We hope to, to get it up there. Um, again, that's a temporary site, but we wanted to have an open site. Some of it would allow us to easily get to it. And what we didn't want to do is take down our existing system. So that's why we chose a completely independent site. Uh, to do it. So you should be seeing that go up shortly. Got some disappointing news out of Raleigh. Hadn't even had a chance to share this with Drew. We had really hoped to be one of the first agencies to seek state accreditation. And we got news at a meeting last week that uh, the pilot program is going to run much further, much longer than originally anticipated. So they're not going to accept the first uh, applicants till sometime probably late 2023. So our hope was to do parallel uh, the uh, league's risk management program with the accreditation program. We're going to back up. We're going to knock out the league's uh, risk management program, hopefully get that certificate fairly soon because we've done the, the legwork to get it. And at least that'll get us that much more prepared when uh, accreditation does launch. Uh, traffic statistics, or, or overall statistics rather, uh, you'll notice that traffic is way up. We are, are, are re- uh, vitalization of traffic enforcement, if you will, uh, has gone well. We still have a great mix, as I've presented to you in the past, of warnings versus citations. That's working really good as a public education piece. Uh, motor vehicle crashes have begun to creep back up as folks have come into town. Uh, again, we're seeing the same crashes we tend to see often, which are slow rear-end collisions for pedestrians crossing the road. Um, I had two arrests this month. One was a trespassing and one uh, actually was a fugitive out of Virginia that we ended up catching here. They held him under a million dollar bond and ended up, uh, Virginia ended up coming and getting him on a governor's warrant. So we may be small, but we do have uh, folks that from time to time cross our borders that we would rather not see. Uh, call statistics, we had uh, 1,513 calls in March. As you see, looking at the prior years, that was one of the highest uh, marches we've seen. 95% um, of the calls we had were self-initiated by our officers. So when folks are saying, what are the officers out there doing? Well, they're constantly initiating things. They're constantly looking for activity, looking for things to do. Um, we've got a fairly young group of officers, and the last thing they want to do is sit around. So they're really getting out there, and what I'm most proud of is they really enjoy engaging with the community and, and the businesses, and that's something just not seeing out of a lot of officers these days. So I think that's a big feather in our cap. Um, March LPR reads, uh, just wanted to highlight the third week in March. So we had 30, just over 37,000 vehicles enter Duck uh, from Southern Shores into Duck. Of those vehicles that came in, we saw 48% of them go into Kerala. So I think that's an interesting statistic, an important statistic when we talk about um, our roads being exceeding the volume that they're designed for. Um, a lot of those folks are, are not staying here in Duck. And lastly, this is dual role. One's a thank you tonight, but I also wanted to highlight uh, Officer Kelly Hill, um, just a phenomenal officer that came to us uh, not all that long ago, but she really is out there engaging. She's really uh, probably the, the single most motivator for traffic enforcement and getting out there and doing it. I uh, rarely see her because she doesn't ever come in the office. Uh, she's always out there, but um, really wanted to take a, a moment to recognize her as I look through the data and look through the statistics. Uh, her name comes up over and over and over again. So doing an incredible job for us. So. Any questions? Thanks, Thanks Chief. Chief. What's the uh, story with the, the uh, speed limit sign up? The second one? Yeah. It's, it's sitting in, on my office floor, and my hope is to get it up uh, maybe by Friday. So it's, it's just been a matter of not being able to get the time, but it's, uh, it's definitely top of my list, so it won't be long.
right. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. This is a very warm welcome. Um, okay, I will be brief this evening. I did want to fill you in very quickly where we are with More Beach to Love, um, basically on a countywide level. Uh, the More Beach to Love website itself is updated along with the web pages that are on the town website. The educational materials that I referenced last meeting that are the county and kind of our subcommittee are working on is a whole that will go into mostly digital advertising, a little bit of print um, and radio uh, are nearing completion. So we're working with um, OuterBanks.com, OuterBanks this week, a bunch of digital advertisers to have some of those things up very soon. So as people are looking ahead to their vacation this summer, they will see a lot of the information. And OuterBanks Visitor's Guide will have that information as well. And um, I have been including uh, something in the weekly e-news, in our Duck Weekly e-news. I'm sure everyone has seen it. And I um, have already created, I haven't made it live yet because we still have quite a bit of time, but I'll make it live soon, probably next month, that email option where if people don't want to get the entire Duck Weekly e-news, if they just want a weekly update on what's happening with nourishment, they can sign up for that one. Um, but since we, we won't be getting staged until August, I figured I wouldn't turn that one on until about May. Um, just some updates on government information, a few things we've talked about in some other meetings. We now are live streaming all public meetings, barring technical difficulties, on our YouTube page. Um, so those are advertised with the link on our website, and um, I put those out on Facebook and Twitter as well. And then the e-news that comes out the Tuesday directly following the council meeting. Lori is so kind to provide me a very quick summary of the actions taken by council because it um, does take a little bit of time to get the minutes together. Uh, so we put that in the e-news right afterwards just to make sure people, if they miss the meeting and if they don't want to watch the video, they can um, catch up very quickly on the actions taken by looking at the agenda and reading that summary. Um, we do have the agendas and the minutes are plainly posted on the website so people can reference the agenda and then they can reference the minutes and the videos are also available on YouTube. The agendas and minutes are up there for five years that people can grab whenever they want. The videos on YouTube are up there for a year. Um, people can obviously get minutes and agendas earlier than five years by contacting Lori. And I do have the videos from earlier than a year, but it just takes up a lot of space, so I don't keep those active on YouTube. Um, some other public information updates. The newsletter is completed, and it should be in the mail very shortly. Oh, apparently I have a timer on that. Oh, this is the brochure, so you didn't get to see the newsletter for very long, but the brochure is also done. And it, it is out, it's being distributed to businesses, um, the visitor centers, it's around town, it's in our lobby and all of our kiosks, those sorts of things. Um, I did get the information for the ARPO mini grant, which is Albemarle Regional Planning Organization, I'm pretty sure. They, traditionally, we have gotten a grant from them that has paid for some or all of our brochure printing because we do include information about bicycle and pedestrian safety, and we do have maps. Um, and so I have turned in that application, and it does sound like we uh, probably will get our entire brochure printing cost paid for this year. You will notice that our brochure is a bit smaller. Uh, we cut down the pages this year, and a lot of that is because people don't want the brochure as much. Um, some businesses don't want the brochures as much. A lot of people prefer it digitally, which they can get on our website. So we're trying to cut down the cost a little bit by um, meeting the needs of people and keeping the information people seem to really need in their hands, like maps, uh, lifeguard stations, things like that, in their hands, and then sending them to the website for things that might change a little more frequently. 
and I just will talk again very quickly about the 20th anniversary celebration. We're getting very excited. We have our food vendors confirmed. Treehouse Kitchen and Vine and Board, the new charcuterie restaurant, will be on site. So um, those will be for anyone in the public. There'll be food vendors for anyone in the public. And because we'll be celebrating volunteers also at this event, they will be, we'll be having food vouchers for our volunteers. We'll have a band called Soul One that will be there. We'll have lots of time for remarks from the stage. And obviously we'll spend a lot of time talking about the 20th anniversary, but because we're kind of doing double duty with this as our first annual volunteer recognition event, we will be talking about volunteers as well. And we will be having, <coughs> excuse me, our special invited guests for a cake cutting. And then we'll have our special exhibit uh, that will be in the first floor conference room. Uh, we'll also have some educational tables about volunteering, the Duck Community and Business Alliance, and the Resilient Coastal Communities Program that uh, Jim spoke about. And we, w we do have ads coming out in local printed materials very soon, or some of them may be out already. And events update, we have, Betsy has done a great job of getting all of the events calendar up on the website, so you guys can check that all out there. And as I mentioned last time, um, we started fitness, we're trying starting fitness that very first week of June, so technically, because of the way June falls, I think it's May 31st that uh, that starts. So we're excited and gearing up for maybe a normal summer. Yeah. I shouldn't have said that, sorry. <laughs> Jinx. That's that's all I have. Do you have any questions? No, oh, that's great. Okay. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm gonna Good evening. also give you a pretty brief update. Um, okay. So I'm going to um, dive right in with the cash balances. Um, total cash on hand for as of March 31st was $17,458,639. Um, as I've said before, that um, number jumped in December when we closed on the beach nourishment accounts. Um, if you were to compare March of last year's cash balance, um, excluding the beach nourishment accounts, we have had a 32.6% increase um, since last fiscal year. Um, the town has ended March with approximately $1,277,557 held in the general checking account. Um, this is right on track with the 10% that we like to hold in there, um, excluding those new beach, beach nourishment funds. Um, the remaining funds, of course, are in the investment accounts and the beach nourishment bond accounts. And I think I noted, I mentioned in the financial reports, the capital trust investment account, the interest is slightly starting to go up. Um, in March, we saw about $650 in interest. Compared to last month, it was about $60. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> a little big, movement there. I mean, it's a small number, but it's a big shift. It is. Yeah. All right, um, so here you'll see the total revenue collections for year to date compared to the budget, as well as the prior fiscal year. Um, as of March 2021, we received the sale in, sales and use tax for December collections in the amount of $126,632. This was just shy of a 9% increase compared to um, the same month last year. Property tax collections received in March were $84,768. These were for the February collections, and um, this brings the town to 98.9% collected. I actually received April's tax reports yesterday, um, and after we receive the April payment, we're only going to have about 9,500 left in receivables. Wow. So that's great. Um, we received occupancy tax for the January 2022 collections. This is that line that we had the timing issue, and I looked further into it, and March is actually when it was corrected. So we are on track. Yay. Comparing it to January of 2021 collections, um, there was a 27% increase. Last year, it was $63,210. 
And then lastly, we received the utility franchise tax for the fourth quarter of 2021 um, in the amount of $79,763. Um, this was a 4% increase. Um, last year's was 76, just over 76,000. Okay. Um, expenditures comparison with the current budget and prior year totals. Overall, our expenses are still within budget. Um, the year-to-date financial reports you received today, you probably still noticed that finance department budget was over, um, but with the budget amendment that you approved this evening, that'll be corrected. And then lastly, revenues versus expenditures. As you can see, the revenues fluctuate month to month um, for March, the expenditures were higher, um, about 247000 but overall year to date, the revenues do exceed the expenditures by close to $1.5 How much? $1.5 Any questions? Well, just on this graph, we're just going to assume that the, you know, the ones that are, uh, oh, Okay, I guess what I'm saying is it's just sort of a rolling chart. Yes, so, because we were only in March, but, and then uh, it'll, when we hit July, that's really actually last July. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Good news Thank all you. the way around. <laughs> Usually you don't get to hear from me during these reports as we have um, other people doing all this stuff. Um, just a few quick updates um, for you. Um, you all know, um, I hope, and I just, this is a good time for the public to understand that uh, we've contracted with Donna Kreef, who is the uh, retired Dare County Planning Director. Um, Donna is helping us with plan review and some of the other more technical uh, planning type functions that we need to, to do in, in Joe's absence. Um, she's been a big help so far. She presented the case for the, t uh, for the town in the Board of Adjustment um, hearing this week, and she'll be making the presentation to the planning board um, and fill that role um, in, in Joe's absence. And we're just, we're thrilled to be able to be working with Donna. She's a very solid professional person. Um, and, and certainly encourage you to introduce yourselves if you happen to, to run into her. Um, she's not here in the office. She's working from home, um, but doing doing a great job for us. Um, let see, more updates. So, um, you know that Joe can find money anywhere. Well, he found a couple of grants um, and and got us pointed in the right direction. So I, I've gone ahead and made application for a couple of grants. This, the first one is through Department of, or North Carolina Division of Emergency Management, and it's a Transportation Infrastructure Resiliency Grant, um, which sounds an awful lot like our BRIC project. Uh, matter of fact, what they're looking to fund and give grants for is almost exactly our BRIC project. So um, we've gone ahead and made application. We'll hear in mid-May on this one. Um, we have total project with the updated costs is about $550,000 funding gap. Um, about 249 of that will carry into uh, fiscal 23. So. I mean, ideally, if, if we can come away with a $250,000 grant, um, we'll, we'll be done um, with that project. Um, you know, I, I, I did forward Joe and, and Chris DeWitt also with DHP. I, I forwarded them the, the grant application, and Joe came back with a comment that the writing looked awfully familiar, and it was. It was all his writing, basically, that I just did a little bit of editing from his, his brick grant uh, application. <laughs> so he did, he did recognize his own writing. Um, and then the, the second grant, also through emergency management, is Disaster Relief and Mitigation Fund grant. We were asking them to... Um, see if they'll participate a little bit in our uh, town hall shoreline, town hall park shoreline uh, resiliency project. 
um, Mr. Hurd had applied for a grant uh, through coastal management uh, to fund a portion of that project. So again, the goal is to have it cost the, ta the duck taxpayers directly nothing. Um, I don't know if that's an entirely reasonable goal, but we'll, we'll work on that. Again, uh, mid-May, we should hear on the results of that. That's a $421,000 project that you heard about um, in, in the CIP presentation. So um, again, uh, Mr. DeWitt and Mr. Hurd both looked at the, um, the grant application and um, Joe again recognized some of his writing. Um, so I'm certainly glad to have him do that, <laughs> do the heavy lifting. I just put it together in the format they needed. Um, let's see. So um, it, on March 21st and 22nd, we had the uh, North Carolina Army National Guard um, cyber assessment team was here. Um, they put out a call to all, all towns in North Carolina, basically saying they will come in and do a cybersecurity assessment of um, your network environment, essentially. Um, for doesn't cost anything. Um, we had uh, a staff member from Shoshin was here for the two days with them, um, mainly to grant them access to our network and also to answer any questions they have. Um, the, the first lieutenant who was in charge of the team here um, really doesn't tell us anything um, other than he said, thank you for the cooperation. Um, I'll be writing my report and giving it to my captain who will contact you with the results. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll share those results with you once we get them uh, from the National Guard. Um, I've been through this. Um, when I was in Apex, we had them come. They spent a whole week there. Um, it was very informative um, and very educational. You know, they're not, they're not looking to point fingers, find fault, or what have you. They're just, they're looking to see if they can help us improve. Um, and the us, a portion of the us there is Shoshin, and, and they were uh, very happy to, to be part of that process. Um, lastly, um, so uh, <coughs> Kim Pittman um, has been working hard to make our restrooms touchless. So the, the restrooms here in Town Hall, which um, get a high volume, I guess I would probably be underselling it, a high volume of, uh, of users. Um, he's installed uh, touchless soap dispensers, touchless faucets, touchless towel dispensers, um, touchless diaper disposal, um, odor, particularly from disposed diapers in the regular trash cans have been an issue um, down there, so that is uh, likely to be a really big help. Um, and then uh, touchless exit handle. So, you know, having having Kim on staff has en enabled us to make those improvements. You also notice it's hard to see in these pictures, but along the bottom of the mirrors, um, he's going to be doing a little bit of a tile work there because the bottom of the mirrors have gotten basically some water gets behind them and it takes the backing off the mirrors and it makes it just look um, unkempt. So he's going to go ahead and get that um, get that repaired. Um, and he's also um, working and he's kind of waiting on me right now to, to pick the, the lights. We're going to, I don't know if you noticed, I noticed this, oh, I don't know, six, eight months ago when I said something to Joe, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we had lights on the signs as you're coming in the duck on, from the north and from, from the north and south, and, you know, those really beautiful wooden duck signs. Um, kind of lost track of it and got got nudged a little bit by a, a citizen, so um, it's gotten moved, moved back up into the into the queue, and hopefully we'll get something on those um, solar powered, so we're not looking to spend, you know, tons of money getting electric service dropped there, but just something to be a little more welcoming than a, than a dark, than a dark welcome sign, so, um, and they are really, they're really pretty signs, so. Um, that's about all I have, unless you have questions for me. Just two, um, are the signs going to be downlit, I would imagine? Um, we're, we're, looking at, uh, we're looking at different options. Yeah, we don't, yes, yes and no, we'll, maybe. Okay. <laughs> um, we're, we're certainly not, we're not looking to, to use a whole lot of light, okay. um, but something to basically highlight the fact that the signs are there, put right. some light Just on them. Right, sort of puts the attention on them as opposed to the Right, yeah, we, we, and that's, that's been, you know, the, the struggle I've had a little bit with some of what's been suggested so far is that's... It's too bright. It's, t it's too much light and it's, um, it's the wrong color light. I'm trying to, I, I'm not a big fan of that blue, 
you know, that mm -hmm. 4,500, 5,000 Kelvin light that's really that bluish, want something a little warmer and more welcoming. So we'll, we'll find the right fixture and we, we want to be very sensitive to light spill right. into the environment too. Also on the cyber um, review, was that something that you asked for? Or did they just pick us or are they doing every town? So um, they put out on the, the th to the managers um, statewide, if you want it, apply for it. Great. Um, so I went ahead and said, yeah, come on. Yep. Good, thank you. Always good to be thank here. That's all I have. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. And staff. Going on to item number nine, mayor's agenda. Uh, a couple items I have here this evening. I have my mayor's and uh, monthly uh, mayor's and chairman meeting on the 19th. It's going to be hosted this uh, month by uh, Southern Shores. Uh, I'm coming off the North Carolina League of Municipalities board in about two to three weeks after serving four and a half years. So I'm getting ready to had my last uh, couple of meetings, the last meeting of the executive committee on 411, the last meeting of the finance committee on 421. And uh, tomorrow for four hours, we have a nominating committee uh, where we're picking the uh, the new slate for nomination for the board of directors. As you know, the, or maybe don't know, the board is 35 people and about half those seats are up every <coughs> two years. Um, I'm remaining president of the North Carolina Local Leadership Foundation. We got our annual meeting scheduled for uh, April 26th uh, uh, this year. And a couple other things. Looking forward to the 20th anniversary celebration. It seems like just yesterday we celebrated the 10th. Time is full, hasn't mm -hmm. it? And uh, the, this is my last point here, and I think we all share this, but we're certainly uh, wishing Joe Hurd a speedy recovery. Uh, we do miss him in the town. That's all I have. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Council Clement, starting with Mayor Pro Temp Thibodeau. Monica. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple of things. I was able to attend recently in Durham the uh, North Carolina State Tourism Conference, and that was really nice to get that back in uh, swing as part of the um, uh, Visitors Bureau uh, vis Tourism Board that I sit on, you know, representing duck. And so I had this great duck wear that I recently purchased. Um, I have a few different shirts, and I wore a different shirt every day, flew the duck colors, and got a lot of great positive comments. So I think I did a lot of great advertising across the state. People were like, oh, I know Duck, I love Duck, or it was a great conversation starter um, to wear the Duck shirts uh, every day. Really nice uh, just to be there and talk about the state. Um, still the sixth most visited state, um, even though we don't have as big as budget as other states, and um, hearing all their ideas on um, just uh, their advertising as a state and, uh, you know, just... Uh, things that, and, and, and the different communities and the challenges they've had. Certainly not everybody during the pandemic fared as well as uh, our coastal communities. And so just a lot of, a lot of really good uh, conversation, a lot of great energy in the room. So I was really appreciative to, to be able to go. Uh, thank you, Don, for your service on the League of Municipalities for all this time. And thank you, Drew, for your continued service. Um, having uh, these two folks um, represent us again on a statewide basis is uh, amazing. Um, I, I really enjoy the newsletters or the magazines that they put out, and I noticed, I don't know if it's coincidence, that Duck gets referenced a few times in that state magazine, different articles. Uh, so thank you for all your leadership in, those, in that really good area. Uh, and then uh, yesterday was an opportunity um, with the board, again, the tourism board and the town, to go to a um, Chamber of Commerce event. Um, I know... Um, Councilman Chiano was there as well, uh, and uh, some town staff, and that was great. Uh, really good food for thought. Uh, the title of the presentation was 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, and it was really just to get you thinking of ways that you don't want to kill your community, and, uh, and a great, uh, great energetic presentation of kind of importance of um, kind of working together and, and uh, trying to find solutions, and, and really, uh, really great uh, things, very local. Um, uh, it's just really good food for thought. So it was a great opportunity to be there. That's all I have. Thank you, Monica. Councilmember Mooney? Rob? Nothing for me. Councilmember Whitman? Uh, the only thing I have to say is that um, I'd just like to thank the community uh, staff planners for the uh, grass planting, the trash pickup. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. 
Thank you, Sandy. Councilmember Shano, Tony. Uh, just a quick update. I attended the Government Access and Education Channel Committee, uh, first one in person from COVID. Uh, it was a good. It was a good committee. Um, you know, they, they they do all the local programming um, access things for town meetings and public service announcements and so on and so forth. Pretty pretty good group of people. It's a good way to. Um, it was a good way to meet some people from the other towns and, and whatnot, and, and also hear what they're doing, you know, which is which is good. So, um, uh, one of the things is, I'm sure you know, our our request was approved for the for the money to redo our mic system here, so we can broadcast everything. So our they approved our request for for that. Um, let's see. Um, they talk about, you know, they do public service announcements about about the beach, enjoy the beach, but be safe and so on. And, you know, my suggestion was, you know, maybe we should try to do something different and innovative on traffic safety, pedestrian and bicycle, because we've had too many tragedies on the 158 bypass. You know, and it's, I, I don't know how we stop it, but we got to do something. So they're going to look into that to see if there's any catchy ways they can they can do something with that, maybe, you know, uh, digitally generated stuff and put it online for the young people or, or whatever. But so they're going to take a look at that. Um, and uh, an interesting thing, you, I think you probably already talked to them. Uh, they said that maybe Southern Shores is thinking of going with the lights green all the time on Saturdays and Sundays on. That mm -hmm. I have not heard. Have you heard might want to check that. That's what the Southern, one of the Southern Shores council members said. He said they're exploring that. I think that would be good, I think. No, they're, they're talking about changing the timing of the light at Seahawk. Okay. Sea Oats. Sea Oats. That's okay. Yeah. No more left turn prevention, though. And then I'll be talking to the engineer. He did some traffic study work for Southern Shores. I've shared it with him with him our data. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, just picked up that tidbit. That's all I had to report. Um, thank you, everybody, for a good meeting, a busy meeting tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see if DOT approves something like that. Yeah. No. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a big request, I guess. Right. Of course, their biggest problem is backup on the west side, and it's going to create more backup on the yeah. west side. So. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you, Tony. Going to uh, 11 other business at this point in time, we'll open it up for public comments. If anyone would like to come forward and address the council, please step forward to the podium, limit your comments to three minutes. There being none, is there any other business to come before the council this evening? In that case, I will remind the council that our next meeting will be the mid-month meeting on April 20th at 1 p.m. With that, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned.